order. Could we all please rise to the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this meeting is being televised by Chelsea Telemedia. I'm assuming nobody else is going to be taping. Um, so welcome. Uh, before we start, I just want to take a moment to um, thank Hannah Barker, who was in earlier today, uh, to film some interviews with members of the school committee for a program she's putting together for CTV called Meet the School Committee. Uh, I think it's a great way for people to learn about the people that sit around this table each week and some of the responsibilities we have as members of the school committee. So I'd like to thank Hannah and her, she also had Teresa Evans helping her today um, with the interviews and hopefully in, in the upcoming future you'll see the, those interviews on TV. Okay. So uh, first item for business is approval of our minutes for our meeting on December 4th. I move that we approve the regular school committee meeting minutes for December 4th, Second. 2018. Second. Second. Any corrections, any questions? Okay, all in favor? All right. All right. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Eight five zero. All right. Uh, next up, we have our Chelmsford High School representatives. Hi, everybody. So um, this week, Selectman Lafave came to speak to um, the civics classrooms about local government. Um, the At We concert is going to be on um, this Thursday, December twentieth, and String Fest is January fifth um, for orchestras grade um, four through twelve. Um, the CHS After School Ensembles concert will be on January tenth. Choral Fest, which is uh, chorus concert for grades 4 through 12 um, will be on January 12th and on January 18th is both the Hawaiian dance for the high schoolers and um, the term the day that um, grades close for term 2 thank you okay uh, next up any good news so I know there's been a lot of concerts at the high school but uh, all the concerts have been going on with the elementary schools and middle schools it's just been like a, a big holiday fest of fun so the, if you had a chance to see them and I, I highly suggest you go see them if you haven't had a chance the kids do an awesome job and they're just so happy to be part of the, the whole process um, I know that good news is we're going on vacation soon so I know a lot of kids are excited about that hopefully they didn't give you too much homework over vacation and um, lastly at the last meeting I forgot to congratulate the Chelmsford High School football team on their win on Thanksgiving Day um, I will tell you that every year there's a, a friendly wager between the two schools to see you know who's going to win between the two superintendents and usually it ends up with either you know maybe serving some food in a cafeteria having to have to wear funny clothes in the center of town have you had a chance to you know have anything happen on this end that was last year yeah that was last year so you have to you know usually have something fun to congratulate the teams so this year since Chelmsford won there was a friendly wager and it was going to be a congratulations on the um, telemedia in Chelmsford or in Bill Ricca based on who won and good news is that we actually won in Chelmsford so we do have a public service announcement from the Bill Ricca superintendent if you can humor me a little bit while I put this back up Still humor me because I'm going to come out and change all the settings. <laughs> doing a good job. I'm doing a great job. I already practiced this like 15 times today. Uh, I'm on the wrong speaker. Here we go, people. All right. Now I think we're in business. Hi, I'm Tim Revolver. Oh, and there's no picture. <laughs> so this is doing great. So talk amongst yourselves. This when it goes up, it's really good. It's really when it goes up, it's going to be unbelievable. So if you can just, like I said, bear with me for two seconds while I just double check that sound again. I had it going perfectly. I do have witnesses, believe it or not, that told me it looked great. So let's do this. Let's go back on. All right. No, it's not gonna. It doesn't like me very much today, but that's okay. Hi, Spirit of Giving. I'd like to thank Superintendent Jay Lang for providing me with this Chelmsford Lions here to change into as much as it pains me to do so. I'd also like to give my congratulations to the Chelmsford High School football team for defeating Bill Ricca on a cold and windy Thanksgiving morning by a final score of six to nothing. I'm proud of both teams for playing a hard-fought game, as well as all the fans from Georgia and Chelmsford who came out to support this great rivalry. 
Thanks, Tim. By the way, you look good in the room. <laughs> Thank you, all teams, for braving the cold. Congratulations to the Chelsea High School football team and coaches on your 2018 Thanksgiving Day win over Florida. We're all looking forward to another great, uh, great game next year. Great job. Thanks, Tim. So that was their friendly wager. It was pretty <coughs> fun. You have to have a little fun while you're doing these things. And that is the uh, end of uh, good news. Uh, just a quick question. Why mm -hmm. didn't you make them actually go outside? Well, uh, yeah, every the every year the wager changes a little bit. So what ended up happening last year, it was my um, uh, first year of doing it. And unfortunately, Chelsea had lost last year. Oh, I so I the right. I so I actually, it. for the first time in my life, had to put on a football uniform <laughs> from head to toe and stand in Borica Center the Monday after Thanksgiving, <coughs> which was incredibly cold, and wave to all the incoming uh, Borica people as they were coming into the district. So that was um, cold and a, and a lot of fun. Uh, so this year, again, uh, we, we decided to lighten it up a little bit. And we said that the uh, losing superintendent would um, do a PSA for the uh, for the community. So that'll be making the rounds in Chelmsford and Borica, and we'll see to it that it gets uh, widely distributed throughout the, uh, throughout the area. But Tim's actually a very good sport. Um, we've got a good uh, relationship among the schools, and I think it's just a nice way to kind of highlight uh, some of the different activity that the, that the kids play in. So it was a lot of fun. Awesome. Okay, anybody else have any good news you want to share? Um, I, I know we're going to talk about it later in the meeting, but I just wanted to congratulate um, the administration, the staff, all the schools on their, um, their ALICE training. Yeah, that oh, nothing really but was. positive feedback on, on, on that for all levels. And, you know, in this day and age, yeah. to get all positive feedback on something, you know, that's just fabulous. So yeah. no, we'll touch that. on it a little bit later, yeah. but it really did go very well. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? Okay, we're on to the public comment part of our meeting. Would anybody like to come forward and speak to the committee? Okay, moving on then. <laughs> on new business. New business. Um, first up this evening, we actually have the uh, History and Social Science Department at uh, the, in the Chancellor Public Schools, so I'd like to invite Stephanie and uh, I know uh, Teacher Dan and Carlos and Mr. Carlos Rector with, you. with me you as like well, so I'm going to just grab a chair for sure. Carlos. And uh, Stephanie is going to uh, make a little presentation on some of the work that's happening within the History and Social Studies Departments within the um, schools district-wide. So welcome tonight, and we'll um, turn it over to you. Do you want me to pull it up? Give me one second and I'll, I just got bumped up again. Uh, pull it up for you. <clears throat> well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to talk to you tonight about what's new in history. We got it. Really? <laughs> new in history. I got it. Yeah, yeah. Right? I got it. Okay. I love it. I was actually really excited about it because we don't have opportunity to do that very often. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so there has been a lot of stuff that's happening that's new in the social studies world, as I'm sure you have all heard. Uh, we have new high school frameworks, and in this link, or on the slide, uh, hopefully you may all get a copy of it. I actually included the links to the new history and social science frameworks for you. The document itself was just approved in June of 2018, so very, very recently. We had, as the department, looked at draft versions of it, but we have not made any gigantic changes yet because we are going to delve into the document over the course of this year to really make a mindful decision about our pathway in history and social sciences. The guiding principles we have gone over in most of the grade levels, so five through um, grade 12, with the exception of grade eight because they haven't had an opportunity yet. Uh, have an opportunity to look at the guiding principles of the document that really focus on um, the knowledge that can be gained from all of the social sciences. So there's a lot of value placed on every social science in the new uh, frameworks and a lot of um, focus on building perspective as well for our students to get a broader perspective other than their own experiences. Uh, we have also started to look at the different standards and skills that need to be taught K to 12. There are seven different skills or standards that they focus on. Um, they talk a lot about civic and civic dispositions, dialogue, media literacy, um, and civil discourse quite a bit. So we're having an opportunity to look uh, at our next professional development day, bringing five, grades five through 12 together to look at how those skills are gonna be taught in grades five through 12 and having some of those vertical alignment discussions with the new frameworks. And then there is a very significant emphasis, like we said, on civics K to 12 
uh, both in the framework, but that's something that we have already started to work on in the district in the last two years. So we'll talk more about that. And I, I wanted to highlight the quote at the bottom of that, which is um, from one of our social studies teachers, uh, Julie Mangan. She teaches grade six over at Parker Middle School. Just as students need scaffolding and models to learn arithmetic and the mechanics of the English language, they also need guidance and support to learn what it takes and how to be a good citizen. I just thought her quote really summed up what we need to do and how we need to shift our focus. So thank you. So this is what we're doing as a department to make sure that we are aware of what the new standards and expectations are and how we can be very mindful of the program that we lay out moving forward. So we're in step one, right, as this just was passed yes. <laughs> recently. Um, and currently we've just wrapped up a inventory of our elementary schools in terms of what resources we have and the um, professional development needs of the elementary teachers. Prior to this year, there has not been a social studies coordinator working with the elementary schools. So this has been just phenomenal, having the opportunity to get to know some of the elementary teachers, start to identify what their needs are, and figure out ways um, creatively to offer them some professional development and support. Um, as they learn the new frameworks because the skill set and the content is really rich, especially um, in grades two, three, and four. It's, it's much more um, heavy than it had been previously, and so there's some new information that they need. Um, <coughs> we have done the guiding principles, so we've gone over the guiding principles in the five through 12, and we'll be working on looking at the skill set, like I said earlier. Um, our next few steps are going to be looking at a scope and sequence. So what is our pathway? What are the options and what will we like to explore? What's going to be the best for Chelmsford and for Chelmsford students? And then we are going to start looking at uh, revising some of our curriculum. So this is going to be a multi-year process. We're not going to just jump right in. We don't have all the information or all the answers from the state about what the expectations are going to be. So we're going to try to be as mindful in our approach as possible. So one of the other items that's relatively uh, a new focus in the frameworks themselves is this emphasis on inquiry and allowing our students to conduct inquiry in the classroom. And this has become part of the elementary lexicon as they've all been exposed to inquiry through the concepts of science. So they all have their inquiry kits that they're going to be um, participating in and have gotten some professional development around those in the last few years. But what's going to be a kind of a mindset shift for all of us is really looking at how we can approach the social studies through inquiry as well. So giving students questions and problems to tackle and look at and providing them with the materials to make some determinations on their own. And if they're looking at problems, what are some potential solutions? And the idea is that it becomes more engaging for the students to explore concepts in the social sciences in this way. Um, we're going to use all the tools of the social scientists. So we're going to provide them with primary source sets. We're going to provide them with archeolo archeological um, artifacts and, and information. So um, data, maps, all kinds of things that all of our social sciences use to really get them interested in wanting to learn more about the world around them. So the other really new big thing in history and social sciences is the newest legislation that was most recently signed by Governor Baker. And I know that Dr. Hirsch had talked about this at um, one of the uh, last school committee meetings. Um, so I highlighted just a uh, overview quickly for you because I know she presented earlier on this. The really big thing is that students are all going to participate in a student-led civics project. And we need to have one in high school and one in any middle school that contains an eighth grade. So our eighth grade teachers have actually, uh, just two weeks ago, all attended, our eighth grade history teachers, all attended Project Citizen training to provide them with an overview and framework of what this could look like um, in our schools. So the four of them and I will be, we've already met 
at each school. So now I'm hoping in our next professional development day to have a conversation with all about all of them to see how this could be a framework potentially for us moving forward for implementation of these civics projects, both in the uh, middle school and at the high school level. Um, Oh, sorry, can you okay. just go back one, right. one more? Thank you, sorry, <coughs> just have a couple more things. Uh, the establishment of the Civic Project Trust Fund for professional development, there's not a lot of information about when that's gonna be coming forward. Creation of a high school voter challenge, um, and this is got, gonna be controlled by the Department of Education, as well as the Secretary of State. Um, but the idea is that it's a voter registration drive for our high school students and Mr. Ricker will talk about this in a, in a few minutes as well, but we've already started that process, um, working with the town clerk's office and um, also with, um, we have someone in our high school in the Career Center, Mrs. Atchison, who helps us coordinate that voter registration drive as well. And then the Commonwealth Civics Challenge in a few years. So once we launch our civics program for eighth grade um, or the projects that we're gonna be looking at, then we'll be ready to allow our students to prepare our students for engagement in that activity later on. Okay. So civics with Mr. Richter, I'm gonna turn it over. <laughs> so um, we have about 50 students enrolled this semester in a half year civics selective, and in the spring we have another 30 students enrolled. Um, due to the timing of the year and the election, we dove right into the uh, primary and the general election in the third district. And then we took a step back and looked at the role of a citizen in the democracy, how citizens get engaged, um, how citizens are informed, uh, and then we had a series of guest speakers come in and talk about the different processes. Um, we first had a, uh, a news editor or someone in like a gatekeeper from Channel 25, uh, Trisha Zuris, the, or Duris, the town clerk, uh, Lisa Marone, the business manager, came in. Um, school resource officers came in. And then we also worked on a voter registration drive right before uh, the November general election where the civics kids made posters and went into uh, plus blocks to get kids to register. And I think we probably got like 50 seniors who would be eligible to vote in the November election to vote or to register and then actually vote. And we'll do the same thing with the April town election again in the spring. Um, We've worked really hard to look at different issues and how they move through the different levels of government. Uh, some of the most, some of the issues we've talked, looked at the most are school safety, specifically around Alice, uh, immigration, climate change, the opioid crisis, affirmative action. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, Kate's lucky enough to be in it. Um, what else have we looked at? Uh, healthcare, um, and it's the kids have been done a really good job. Like we, the one thing we've tried to focus on is the role of healthy debate in a democracy, and that it's not just black and white, and we've really tried to keep politics almost out of it, and to really talk about like the issues, and look how it's not just like, the, there's way more than two sides to every issue. So like, we're doing immigration right now, and we're actually gonna form a four-sided debate about it. That like, it's not as, it's not as simple as the local, or as the media would make it out to be, it's a much more complex issue. So the kids have done a really good job. Um, we're going on a field trip to the State House for a presentation on January 7th, and the kids are also starting, my kids haven't quite started this yet, but they will, uh, a large um, research-based project at the end of the school year to, to, plan a, to plan one of those types of projects without actually implementing it, but to do the steps necessary, like what would lead to the civics-based project? Um, what, would they, what problems are they looking to solve? So, and Representative Golden is coming in on Thursday. So Mr. Richter and Ms. Durkin, who couldn't be here tonight, have done a wonderful job. We initiated this course uh, for this school year, so it's the first time it's running, and we have close to 80 students, as you heard, just in its first year of kids who have been really interested in it. So it, that was a wonderful response, and the kids seem really energized, and good. Catherine's doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so we, next slide. The other new thing in our social studies department is the course AP Research, which is the second year of the uh, AP Capstone program, which we launched last year. Um, so the students that I have here with us, and we're going to have two more just join us real quick, um, scoot up with took the chair. AP Seminar course last year, and now they're taking AP Research. Today, <coughs> myself, Mr. Uh, Dr. Lyons, uh, Mr. Murray and Dr. Rosa had the opportunity to serve as uh, an informal uh, internal review board 
to review their research and ask them questions about the level of um, inquiry that they're doing in their class. So I'm just going to let them briefly introduce themselves and quickly talk um, about the project that they're working on or any ideas about what they're... There we go. Go ahead, guys. Hi. <laughs> Hi, my name's Ayush. Uh, hi, my name's Saviana. And uh, my name's Carlos. And the three of us are all students in um, the new AP research course at CHS. Uh, right now, there's 12 of us enrolled in that class. All two of us took AP seminar last year. Um, basically, as part of AP research, we build off of the skills which we learned in AP seminar last year. So last year, we learned about um, how to be inquisitive and um, synthesize arguments and form them into one cohesive argument. This year, we're taking this uh, one step further by not only looking at previous existing research, but also finding a gap in the research and identifying steps to fill that gap um, by conducting our own independent research. So um, I guess I'll just get into it. Um, my exam uh, well, an example would be the research question. We each have our own individual research question, which we've worked with um, our teacher and um, uh, basically um, for this whole year, um, our first step was to develop our own in our own research question it can be in almost any topic we choose and um, but it has to be a rather specific research question and um, the question I'm tackling is uh, what impact does um, seating location have on the academic performance of children in uh, elementary classrooms in suburban high in suburban schools um, and uh, essentially uh, we have to go through all processes that a normal research paper would have to go to go through. Um, including um, proposing the question, then getting it approved by an IR, uh, by our institutional review board, and then um, ethically conducting all the research ourselves um, and under, of course, the guidance of our teacher, who te by um, AP, not law, but AP um, regulations can't help us all that much. She can guide us, but she can't exactly um, tell us or grade our work officially. She has to sort of um, let us be on our own, and um, we have to conduct it all ethically and. <coughs> In the end, um, we're going to be doing this during January and February, and then after that, we will be taking our research, forming a full research paper, um, uh, full size, and uh, then doing submitting that to the College Board, as well as creating a presentation and presenting. Um, it's about a 10 to 15 minute presentation that we will also submit to the College Board, and that will be our AP grade, but then I believe we also get to have our research paper as a research paper we've written in high school. And one thing that I really like about AP research is it's more than just writing a paper. So for me, I've personally developed my oratory skills and presentation skills. And so my research question focuses on the impacts of high school girls conforming to current societal beauty standards and how this affects their dependency for cos cosmetic products. And I feel like it's allowed me to look at more beyond like just something that affects our high school, but looking beyond things that are so, like super prevalent in our society, like the idea that you have to look a certain way, you have to do certain things, and I think it's helped like widen my perception of like the world around me, and it's definitely a rigorous course, but I think it's really rewarding, so. Okay. You guys good? Yeah. So. Thank you. They are awesome, and I saw some of them present today, and it was just fabulous, and their presentation skills are outstanding, and they're able to stand up and feel confident when even being grilled by a few of their uh, administrators. So they did a wonderful job. In this slide, I've also co connected a link to the AP Capstone program for all of you if you have further questions about the program itself. If our students um, successfully complete the uh, AP research course and earn a three or higher as they have in the AP seminar course, plus they've scored three or higher in four more AP courses, they're eligible to receive an AP diploma from the College Board as well. So it's it's an incredible amount of work and they're doing a wonderful job and Ms. Schultz, who's teaching it for the first time this year, has done just an outstanding job of, of keeping it all together as she has 12 different students working on 12 completely different projects throughout the course of the year. So. Yeah. What does an AP diploma equate to as far as So according college? to the College Board, they say it's very similar to an IB, so an International Baccalaureate program, because of the so level of So how do they rigor. know what credit level they'll get if they're accepted into a college in 
generally it's like you get a right. five on an AP, you get college level credit. If you get a one, not so much. Right. So it's the same thing. So it, it's really going to be college dependent upon what, so some universities are accepting um, that level of credit for each of the courses, or they may only accept certain courses. It will depend on the, the university itself, plus their declared majors as well, because sometimes they don't always accept your, um, your major because they want you to take all of the courses within that major. Right. So right. that's going to be dependent upon the university. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and then the last slide we have is uh, some excitement that we had on December 4th, which these are our Geography B winners for 2019. And at Parker, we had Ryan McGalligut, and our McCarthy winner was Jassy Dukes. I, um, we have everybody in grades five through eight take the preliminary exam. We whittle that down to our top 10 finalists, and they are the ones who are on stage answering some very tough questions that sometimes I cannot pronounce. So they do a wonderful job. Um, Parker this year, I was the moderator for Parker's Geography Bee, and we went to sudden death. It was incredible. <laughs> the kids were just amazing. It was an outstanding group. I've never gone through so many questions in a Geography Bee before this year. And sudden death, was it was intense. It was great. So I just wanted to give an opportunity to congratulate these two again. Thank you all. Stephanie, real quick, is yeah. the uh, geography be limited to seventh and eighth grade? Did you say that? It's or? I actually do fifth through eighth. Oh, fifth yeah. through eighth. Yeah. Okay. So we have um, everybody in the in the both middle schools will okay. take the preliminary exam, and then the top ten scores okay. will move on to the next round. And sometimes we have fifth through eighth right. representation, yep. and sometimes we don't. Just curious. Any other questions? Any other questions? Anybody? No, I think that this is fantastic. For, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was a very informative presentation. And congratulations to you three um, on your accomplishments thus far, and I'm sure you'll be very successful. I think whether or not it translates into college credits, I think the skills that you're going to learn will be invaluable as you go forward um, in college. I'm really happy to see you um, pr uh, enhancing the inquiry process. I think this is going to be a very difficult process, yeah. and I'm glad to see that um, it's being generalized into other areas. Um, you know, I think we're most familiar with it in terms of science, but as it's applied to social sciences, I think that's really terrific. John Morris and I meet pretty frequently, actually, <laughs> and discuss how we can make um, the concepts easier for everyone to grasp if we're working together and showing them the relationship between social studies and science. Right, and I think this really sets the stage, especially for kids as they go on to college in terms of conducting the research, if they're not, you know, necessarily yeah. uh, participating in this uh, level of programming. Yeah. I just wanted to quickly say, so my experience is at the third grade level, not personally, but uh, with my daughter. <laughs> and, uh, well, you were a third grader at I one once, point. Once, once. Um, probably before they had programming like this. But um, yeah, so I, I did want to say that it was a great experience to see my daughter. She did a report on Molly Pitcher, and she did do all the research, and we sat down and got to do a report together. And I love history, and I was super interested. We got to go to the North Bridge, um, which my wife actually chaperoned, and um, it was a really intense thing for my daughter to do, but she read a lot and she did the work and she really enjoyed it. And um, getting to witness it all firsthand is really, really a fun, fun part of the process. So thank you for the work. Yeah. Other questions, Al, John? No, I'm okay. just impressed with the quality of the kids that we keep coming. Yeah, they're see. pretty awesome. Now on the civic front, the local civic, are, are, are students gonna be watching selectman meetings now? And <laughs> we hope so. Uh, we did watch some clips earlier from, okay. um, one of the earlier town meetings specifically around the debate around chickens and a little mm -hmm. bit about straws yep. and uh, plastic bags. Yep. Um, Selectman Lefebvre had some interesting comments to say about that and uh, his feelings on how, how that's been going. But it depends really upon what's going on in the news. We're trying to be as current uh, event focused as possible. So um, unfortunately with the wildfires in California, We've talked about that a lot, about insurance and about like policy around that. So we, you know, every every class we start by having a student present a current event, and that can kind of drive the conversation for that class. So it, it really depends on what it's really student driven as to what issues they're trying to tackle. Yeah. No, if we were fortunate enough to have some student reps here that you know, participate <laughs> in our meetings, so I don't know if they were going to other board meetings and that type of thing. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you very much. No, Thank that you was very, very much. Insightful. Thank you. I really appreciate all your hard work. Thank you. Hey, um, 
Our next topic is um, at our last meeting we decided that our next public forum would be on January 29th, which I believe is Tuesday, uh, at the police station at their conference room. Uh, and they, the topic would be uh, alternative scheduling options. So um, Donna and, and, and Barbara, we're going to work on the agenda for that. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys and you can kind of let us know what we're thinking. Uh, well, at this point, I think that the, the rough draft of what we have is um, 180 days, new ways of looking at the, uh, at the school day. And the topics that we would cover would be uh, blizzard bags and e-learning, uh, the pros and cons of the um, alternative structured learning day. Um, another topic would be vacation consolidation, exploring the idea of replacing February and April vacations for one week in March, with, uh, with one week in March. And then um, later start times at uh, Chelmsford High School. Um, you know, I think those are some, those sound great. Um, you know, I think um, people should understand too. We're, we're we're not looking to make changes right now, which is just uh, presenting some options that are out there, um, just to educate people. Uh, you know, these are definitely topics that are being discussed in other districts. But just to kind of get it out there, talk about the pros and cons, uh, because there are positives and negatives to all these things. And so I think when we come up with the agenda, that's just part of we we should just have some sort of you know, overview and that, that that's what the objective of our, our forum is, um, to, to provide information, to provide both sides, to get feedback too. You know, some, some people, you know, might like these ideas, they might not like these ideas, so it'd be nice to hear from, mm -hmm. from parents and teachers and, and even students, um, you know, what their thoughts are on these things. So, right. um, so we'll try to formalize something um, and that way we can get it out to the public and... Yeah, I think just um, advertising-wise, if when we get back together again in January, we're not going to meet the first, obviously, so we meet the, the second um, Tuesday in January the 8th. So if we had a real kind of solid rough draft on the mm -hmm. agenda that evening, um, I can work with Linda and we can um, start to advertise it and, and push it out because I think it's just three weeks later. Um, so we can do that. And we can reach out to different groups if you'd like. Um, I'm happy to, you know, try to put information together or have Linda or others as well. Yeah. Um, so you just kind of tell me what you're looking for info-wise. We can kind of firm up then. That'll still give us plenty of time. But at least we can start to push out the um, the, um, the dates and the agenda. We held the date, so that's that's locked in. But just to get people um, knowing what we're, we're scheduled to do. Right. And so if particular people fine. you want to, to speak, I, I know I'm sure Carlos would be one of the ones that would want to speak on the, um, the late start time, but if there are other people that that you, you know of that would you know, be good source of information on these things and, and kind of get them on the agenda. Yeah. Right, great, thank you very much for, for doing that. All right, uh, next up, uh, follow up on um, new school committee member orientation um, handbook. Uh, so last meeting, uh, presented a, a draft copy of a school committee handbook that sort of outlined uh, the responsibilities um, of being a school committee member, how we conduct our business, that type of thing. So to help people out, you know, if, if we do get new members on the committee to kind of give them a framework with, with what it's all about. Uh, and so we decided to kind of take the, the two weeks and look it over and, and come back with some suggestions. I know Donna had suggested putting in a checklist um, that the new school committee members could kind of go through as they kind of made their way through the first few weeks. And so that's on there now. It's um, in the uh, appendix. Um, so any other suggestions or things that you like, you don't like, you want to put in, take out, um, you know, yeah, definitely yeah. weren't made available before anyone makes a decision to run. Um, one of the things that I thought that I, I didn't see it in there, but anything about the self-evaluation that we do. Okay, I think it might be, but I can double check. Yeah. I think there might be something, but I'll, I'll go back and check. Uh, the only comment I would like to make is I think um, the, the length is about right. Yeah. I think it's um, big on brevity, keep it short, keep it simple. I do like that. I like short, too. Yeah, well, no, you, you're, in, you're seating on camera, oh. nobody knows. Uh, but no, overall, I do like it. I like the checklist. Um, gives you some things to like, just kind of work towards. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts as you went through it? I just had a couple um, small edits. Mm -hmm. I guess some of these run-on sentences I, I needed oxygen for. Oh. They were so long. Okay, that is one of my faults. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. right. um, so I can show you those. I also included uh, the links to the um, MASC. Um, documents uh, that provide some more in-depth knowledge yeah. for this. The only so, question I would have on that, and I know you mentioned it last time, are, are they member-only areas, though? Will yes. somebody? Oh, so, yes. They, so they, somebody they, that 
isn't a member wouldn't be able to access them um, so yes they are uh, member only however um, I think that uh, it's it they kind of dive deeper into some of these things okay okay so for example uh, on the chairman they have a great um, document on there about you know what the responsibilities of the chairman um, and so I don't know if you just want to include if somebody was looking for more information okay. um, and then um, on page nine um, last last paragraph it's this is about the superintendent evaluation it says throughout the year the superintendent will provide evidence of his performance based on the annual goals established at the start of the year and I just want to clarify how that was going to happen I, you know we'll, I mean so like for example Jay I know you've sent us some emails and things like that so I've saved that um, I didn't know if we were going to do anything I know that Barbara had brought up in the past about <coughs> an evidence binder um, and I, I know it also includes in here that we'll be responsible for collecting our own information um, but if you're going to provide it I was just kind of curious I think underneath to, that too though yeah. is a list of, of, of ways he would do that so reports okay. and research presented by, prepared by the superintendent recommendation from the superintendent of range of subjects and so on this probably all right, so that's what you want to use? I, I, okay. I think that's, All right. yeah, it's a All right, pretty that's comprehensive fine. list of, of ways to present evidence. Yep, okay. I think that's fine. Okay. I just want to make sure that, I wasn't sure that they went necessarily together, yeah, but I understand did. what you're getting at. Okay. Now. okay. So you're, you are going to pr pr uh, provide a, ra a rating for every standard? We do, I believe. Yeah. Okay, so you, you would need evidence for every standard in order to rate it. I believe that's how we do it, yes. Well, that's how Teach Point does it. Yeah. That's what we use in the public school system. So I would assume that we're going to do that. I mean, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, evaluation, which is both uh, teacher and administration. But there's so many components underneath the standards. So I don't know if you're looking to clarify any of that. So I'll be talking about the standards, the indicators, and the elements. Yeah, no, I think this list is great. I just I didn't make the connection. I think as far as the evaluation too, I think it's very user friendly in terms of it outlines where you know the, the areas. That we're evaluating one, I, you know, I haven't ever had any problem with with figuring out what it is I'm supposed to be rating one. So I don't know if anybody else had any issues, but um. all right. Uh, so where do you want to go from here? Do we want to make this uh, a, a link to the, the school committee website? Do we want to provide this as a hard copy? I don't know how we want to. I'm sure we need to neaten it up. Obviously, <coughs> cut some of the if, add on, you know, run on sentences. Probably get a little right. bit more. Um, Formatting in it, what Dr. Hirsch's specialty is yeah. formatting documents to, you know. I like, I like them to, you know. If so you, have, so if, you like the, if you like the general content yeah. of what's been presented at this point, if you want, we can give it one kind of grammatical and formatting review yeah. um, and then present it to you in like final, final form at the January 8th meeting. Okay. And then if you uh, like it, we can actually, I think it's best to just post it to the website under the okay. school committee page. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you can, we can print a hard copy too if you want to give it to someone. Okay. But I think if we posted it online, if people could access it, and then it could be kind of a um, living document. Right, and I was thinking that I can see this evolving as time goes on. You know, right. So. Yeah, you might find something well, you want to add to a checklist or change or right. change a link or whatnot. And the committee's um, constantly so changing. That. So they may yeah. have different ideas than we right. have exactly. in five cool. years, yeah. right? Yep. So. Great. Well, the timing's good, too, because that's when the election stuff will start to pick up. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Great. So I'll have it. We can do a good edit and formatting by the time we get together <laughs> in January. Right. Great. Uh, this kind of segues into the next um, next item. Um, as we discuss some of these things, um, the issue of our current policies and what to do with them right. came up. Uh, so right now on our, our website, we do have our old policies. Mm -hmm. So the question is, do we keep them up until our MASC policies are online? Do we take them down? Do we put a message on there that we are updating them? Do we put right. a PDF of the new policy? I don't know. So I figured this would be a good discussion what people think would be the best way to proceed. Do we have a timeline for when they're going to be up? Yeah, when I talked to Mike Gilbert last, he was indicating we should probably have the, um, the link back to be able to link to the new mm -hmm. uh, database uh, the end of January, early February. It's a long time, um, yeah. So it is a good amount of time. And I actually just mentioned this to Dennis because if someone looked at our policies now, technically they're being directed to our old ones. Um, so the question became, you know, do we leave our old ones up so it looks like we have policies because I don't have the other ones to put up. Do we basically take them down and just put a disclaimer on the page saying, you know, the committee has just updated their policies. A hard copy of the policy manual is in the superintendent's office now. MASC has sent that along. So we have, like, the official bound copy in the office. Um, and that we anticipate the web version will be posted by the end of January, early February. Um, something like that. So 
and I, I asked Dennis, and we just said we should talk about it tonight yeah. to kind of figure yeah. out what to do Could before we, we did it. So we temporarily post the PDF version <coughs> of the new policies until it's up. It's not ideal, but at least it's there and it's correct. Um, it, it, I'll tell you though, it's cumbersome. Uh, it's like if we post it as one giant PDF, it's. Right. Um, well, you then you have to break up the links. Yeah, it's like line. very difficult to kind no, of get through. It, yeah. Um, and I think, you know, for basically a month, there'd be a lot of work to go into to just get that up there for a month. If by the end of January, hopefully, we're going to have the other site. Um, you can't break it up into seven sections and post each section? Yeah, without all the subsections? Yeah, I mean, With the disclaimer it's, saying that it's this up is temporary? To you yeah. yeah, if you, if you um, want to verify the accuracy of any of the policies that are posted here, please go to Central Administration. Well, they'd be accurate. It just it wouldn't be like like you could click on something; it would bring you like a hyperlink. Doesn't right do that to now, it. right? <clears throat> no, but right now, like each individual policy is listed individually, right? So if we just did it by section, we would basically scan in, say, like uh, section A, you know, twenty or thirty policies as a packet, right. and you would literally have to kind of scroll through if you wanted to find something. So I mean, it's temporary. Like, like they'll link now. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. I don't like the disclaimer idea. I don't. I just think that. I think though that if there if there any question that policies that are posted are not accurate feel free that they are accurate at the central administration and you can check them there right but I guess the question would be um, if we actually just take down the old policies on the site the old policies are no longer valid right we've gone Correct, through them we've we changed should, them we've so updated them are no one. longer valid but we should take those down yeah mm -hmm. and then do like a in, like an interim type thing and post just a pdf document of our the new one's up, even though it's not going to be pretty. Just do that for the month yeah. until we have the new link yeah. to the site. We'd prefer to do that. If, well, and you can put a disclaimer on, on it saying <coughs> they're going to be a <coughs> searchable yeah. so format. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, with that we can do over the Christmas break. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and probably get those up. Sounds good to me. Right. That agreeable to everybody? Just you know, yeah. we didn't even think about it until we we're discussing it, and then all of a sudden we realized, well, we still have our old policies up there, um, and that's what people would. If somebody was looking at a policy, they'd probably go there find one and they wouldn't be the right one so I right. don't want to you know confuse people there's different numbers and everything else so right okay right. I can do that Great. all right moving on um, yeah next actually Linda is going to share an academic update with us sure so um, usually yearly you'll receive the um, advanced placement SAT and ACT information from the school counseling department and as you all know we have a change in guard with that we have Lorraine Wilson who just started with us keeps showing back up which is a good sign but since she just started the past few weeks I think it would have been a little overwhelming for her to actually go through this whole process um, so I said I'd be more than happy to walk everyone through what it looks like for our our different data that we have so it just happens to be timely because I know there was a couple of questions about AP so hopefully as I go through this process I can give you a little bit more details about AP and then we'll move on to SAT and then the, uh, the ACT so um, let's start with some background on AP. So AP courses reflect what is uh, taught at t introductory college levels for students. So at the end of the course, students are now eligible to take the AP exam. But I will tell you, students can take an AP exam without taking an AP course. You, you pay for the course, I mean, you pay for the exam and you can take it. So they are more prepared for it though after taking an AP course with us at the district. And what that does is it measures how well they've mastered the college level coursework. And students who do well on that AP, so that's that three to five range, they can apply and get hopefully college credit, but it is college dependent. A lot of the colleges are not accepting that as much. Um, a lot of schools, of course, with AP going on, they made more and more AP courses available. And then the colleges, I think, got a little like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> That's kind of dipping into our, our, our work here. So you will find that some of the colleges are not taking that. They'd be looking more for a dual enrollment class. So what does it look like and when you're taking an AP course? So they tend to be a fast-paced course, uh, more material that is covered than a typical high school class. Students are required to work independently. They complete lessons and assignments and homework. So when they are taking the class for, uh, for AP level, we encourage them to look at their time management. We look at prioritizing their work, work forming study groups amongst themselves, and also designating specific areas for that studying and homework when they are not you know, either in school or actually when they are in school as well. It's still working. So we, again, why would you take an AP exam? 
And it's, it's important that if you can get that college credit, it will help you to move forward. So for example, if you wanted to study abroad, that might give you the opportunity to get some coursework under your belt and you'll have a little bit more time to study abroad. You might want to pursue a double degree, right? So that would also open up some of that time and for students to take more coursework than some of the courses that they have to take as like a, almost like the general education requirement courses. So it does pull some of that out of their way. And um, it just gives them that, that extra edge. We know a lot of kids are studying more than what they typically would have done maybe when I, even I went to college. So you just want to afford them that opportunity to get that advanced um, coursework. And quite honestly, it does save in, in money for college tuition if you, you know, are paying for that bill. It's nice to have a couple of credits. So this is just a quick overview of what we offer for our courses at um, Chelmsford High School. They are a little bit deeper than just what you see there. So for example, like when you're looking at English, there's the lit and composition, there's the language and composition. You know, French, it has the French language, there's the music theory. So underneath even these headers, there are multiple tests that go through that. But these are, you know, your, your basic classes. So I think there were upwards of uh, 26 to 29 AP classes offered at Chelmsford High School. So what you see in front of you now is obviously our five-year score summary. So it gives you a kind of an idea of where Chelmsford is compared to you know, what's happening with the state. So success on that AP exam, again, is a three or higher. And the National Center for Educational Accountability has found that AP scores and the score of three or higher is particularly a strong predictor for students to be successful in college. So those persistence rates, rather than going to school and not sure how you're going to do, usually if the students are a three or higher, it's a good indicator that they're going to be fine and successful in graduating in a four-year period. Can you just pause right there? Yep. That is a, that's a really impressive slide. That's, that's a really impressive performance. I will tell you that, that I didn't create that. I took that picture and put it on there, but no, <laughs> you saying it is. They, they do, I mean, a lot of people will say, oh, your scores are flat. Well, our scores are flat because they're high. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, you can only get so, when you're hitting the fives, there's no six. I so think. it becomes, a, it's, it's pretty, the kids work really hard um, in those courses. You're not taking that course lightly. You don't walk into an AP course and just be like, oh, I hope it, it goes well. These are kids that really want to put their effort towards something. And if they're taking APs in a certain subject area, it might give them the leg up to get into the college of choice. Yeah, and I think in Massachusetts where education is so highly rated, um, to have scores like that against the state averages, just really, that's great work by a lot of people. Yeah. That's all. Sorry. That no, nope, that's a, fine. No. That was an impressive slide. Great. So just to give you some statistics, so in the month of May, all right, we had um, uh, 282 students took 579 advanced placement e exams with 72% uh, of the grades falling in the 3 to 5 range. The program um, grades are on a five-point scale, so you have extremely uh, well-qualified, well-qualified, qualified, and then possibly qualified, and then ones and no recommendation. So generally, AP grades of five, four, and three are comparable to college grades of A, B, C, and many colleges will award <coughs> one or two courses worth of credit to successful AP candidates who score at least that three. And the kids usually, you know, they do a good job. They know what schools um, are going to accept those college credits. And the, and the guidance council is when they're meeting with the colleges, they have a, a good idea of what's happening. So this is just, a, you know, an overview of all the exams that were taken, how many students, and then how many total exams there were. So w what I was talking about earlier, so I had physics up there. There's a physics one, there's a physics two, there's mechanics. We may not offer the last two courses, but our students sometimes go and take those courses in addition to what they're doing or if they were in a directed study. So it just gives you a little overview of what's happening. So now we're moving on to SAT. And most of us are pretty familiar with the SAT. It's, it's kind of the one that's been around for a while. And it's a recognized college admission test that shows the colleges what you know and how well you can actually apply that knowledge to your coursework. So it tests um, reading, writing. It's a reading and writing combination test, math, subjects there also is an essay it's an optional essay there was changes in the SAT starting in 2016 so that's where you'll start seeing that essay portion and basically they're trying to see how you're doing with the, you know everyday coursework that's taught in high school classrooms so most students take the SAT during their junior and senior years um, usually that fall year is the last time they'll take the SAT before applying to college Soph sophomores take the PSAT so they have a good idea of what that test is like and um, 
almost all colleges and universities will use those scores to help make a determination if they are accepting the SAT. There are some colleges you don't have to take the SAT anymore. They, you don't have to provide them, but if they are doing it, they use it as, a, as an admission status. So what is it actually uh, measuring? And I did uh, let a few people know when they first got here. I did have to change this slide. I did, I apologize, I had an older slide up there. So this is the newest slide and I'll be more than happy to send it to you. I had the old requirements in. So this is actually the new requirements. So it's basically, it's what you're learning in school at this point for reading and math and writing. What they've done at this point is, it used to be critical reading, now it's called evidence-based reading and writing. So it's a combination of predetermined text now. So rather than just these arbitrary questions that they were asking, there is a, it's text-based, similar to what our kids are actually doing for MCAS at this point. They have a text that they read and they move from that. And they're already predetermined with one of them being in US um, and world literature, two in history and social science two in science, and then what they have is like graphs and data added so they can help those students make a, an informed argument. And there still is grammar and logic questions, but it's all based off of that reading passage. And then when it comes to the essay, it's a little bit longer than the original essay, so it's 15 minutes. But again, it's based on an author posing some type of argument, and then you have to analyze how that argument is put together, and you're basically scored on a scale of one to eight. Uh, for reading analysis and writing. So it is actually testing part of your reading comprehension because if you miss the argument, you won't be successful in being able to explain that author's piece. And the mathematics didn't change that much. Basically, what they did is they did add in those multi-step problems for students. And there are a few sections that like, calculators are banned. I mean, they like literally say that. So it's a way they wanna see the kids show their work. A lot of the cal calculators now are those graphing calculators. So they want to see that the students actually understand the theory behind what they're doing, not just being able to punch something into a, um, a device. So this is the, and remember, we're talking about the class of 2018, so we're always in basically their arrears with our students. So this is what we ended up having for um, Chelmsford students' results. So again, another fun fact is that Chelmsford High School is the largest testing center in the Merrimack Valley. So we have, during the, this past school year, there are seven Saturdays that are dedicated for all students in the area to be taking this exam. And that includes also the PSATs. So Chelmsford High School is super busy when it comes to that. But um, Chelmsford High School average SAT scores from the class of 2018 continue to be higher than the Massachusetts and national scores. So in the evidence-based reading area, Chelmsford scored 598, um, which is 36 points higher than the state average, and 562 points higher than uh, I'm sorry, 62 points higher than the national average. And in mathematics, they were able to score, they scored 200, 611, that which was 48 points higher than the state average, and also 80 percent, uh, 80 points, I'm sorry, higher than the national average. So these scores are going up and up as these students take this test. What's the highest score a student can get? Say it again? What's the highest score a student can get? They can get, so, it's, so it all depends. So now the new reading and writing, it's a total of 1,600 and it's still 800 for math, so it's 2,400. Okay. Right, did I do my math correctly? Hopefully. Oh, good. Yeah, good, good to know. Um, so they're basically scoring higher and higher as they go along, and you can just look at the, you know, the different years. And the reason you have the NAs in there is that they didn't have the critical reading piece. It's now that new combined test. And then moving on, this is not as uh, well known a test. It's becoming more well known on the on the East Coast. It's more of a West Coast piece, but it's really a, a different test, and it's it's great. So this is the American College test, otherwise known as the ACT, and say, basically it's a curriculum um, based achievement test. It measures that college and career readiness, so similar to what students are used to and teachers with the MCAS. So it has the English, mathematics, reading, science, and there's an optional writing test. And it also has a little bit of that non-cognitive component, so it wants, you like, obviously your high school information and grade, but your actual interest inventory, so it's looking at what a kid's interested, what are they looking to do, and then a student profile session. So what happens here is scoring, it's basically um, multiple choice sections, both in English, math, um, not both, but in English, math, si reading, and science. And students earn one point for each correct answer. But if they do miss the, the answer, they don't get penalized for it. So we always tell kids it's always good to answer that. And that was a change, too, a little bit in the SAT before, is if you got it wrong, you were hit for it. 
So a student's raw score is basically calculated by determining the amount of questions that they answered. They can get a total of 60, and they calculate that um, for points, and then that's the raw score, and it actually translates into 36 points. The highest they can receive is 36 points. So this is, again, not a very um, well-known test in the area, but I, we're finding more and more students are taking the ACT along with the SAT because they want to have both of those components. In southern schools and western schools. <coughs> yes, yes. So schools do a little better on this one than males. They do. And, you know, people used to say, well, it's because it's easier. And I'm like, no, actually, it's not, it's easier. not easier. It's not easier at all. So it's not a, oh, take this test and hopefully you'll be able to get into something. It really gives a, a better, well-rounded piece of where the students are and how they're actually functioning. So it, it's, again, a cost, but it might be worth the cost to finally get that balance and show that consistency for a student. My experience has been that sometimes if kids don't do well on the SATs, they do better on the ACTs. Because yeah, it's a little bit more familiar to them, mm -hmm. because it's the way that they've been you know, taught, tested, so it's, it's not the SAT, which has a little bit more of that multiple choice piece to it. And you'll see, it's, it's funny, I'd be curious to look a little deeper, like the class of 2017, only 75, like look at the numbers of you know, 109, 123, and then there was this big drop in 2017. I don't have really, an, you know, an answer for that, but I'd be curious as to why. I mean, did most of our kids apply to schools that were only SAT driven? So it'd be interesting. Is that they only offer the test on the weekend and not the weekday? Oh, that could have been. That's there right. Was that one year that they did that. I think that might have been the year. Yeah, it could have been. Uh, what Dr. Lang is saying is that there was one year that they were only offering the test at a certain time, and the kids were probably like, I have something else to do, or maybe they were taking the SAT at well, that point. They usually do a weekday, I believe, either yeah, weekend. Yeah. And there was one year they didn't do, for some reason, the Thursday test, yep. and they only did the weekend. That would test. make so sense. So that might have been the year that they and did. And I can that. certainly look into that. I'm curious. As soon as I saw that, I was like, hmm, I wonder why. What, what's the big dip? But I didn't even think of that. Are we a testing center for ACT too, or did it go to another school? No, it's, it's, it's in a different place. It's uh, a lot of the kids, it's almost like in a, around here I know they're going to almost like a, you know, like 129, like a business place, right. and they just rent out that place and they have to take the ACT. So that's really just the, you know, the overview of what's happening at, at the high school level for those three pieces for academics, and we just wanted to make sure that you had a chance to review that and ask any questions that you might have. I think it was about three or four years, no, it was actually longer, uh, maybe four or five years ago, there was some discussion or concern that the SAT scores in Chelsea were actually going down, so it's kind of nice to see them coming up Yeah, and I remember going that up. too, but if you saw, the, if the dip was so small right. that it wasn't, and it, that's when people right. started talking about, oh, you have flat data, the, the kids aren't getting higher and higher, but then it, it seems to, you know, the upswing or the uptick was there, plus the test changed too. Right, I think it, it was very small, and I think that we were concerned about it trending downward, but it right. doesn't look like it did that. No. Other questions? Switch, I'm going to switch over to the next one. So do you want me to just keep yeah. going? Or? If you could, so um, the next thing Linda's actually going to do for us is there have been some um, guidance changes coming from the Department of Education around uh, teacher evaluation and the evaluation uh, system. So this is something that we're um, not making any changes right now, but this is something we're obviously going to have to be looking at over the coming months and years. Um, so uh, Linda was kind enough to put together a um, little presentation on this for you, just to give you a flavor for some of the, um, uh, the changes that we're going to have to take into consideration. So since tonight was the history night, I'm going to go back in history and talk a little bit about the process and what Chelmsford is currently doing right now and then what some of the changes are. It is complicated, <coughs> so feel free to slow me down or ask some questions because it's something that I do on a regular basis and I have to take pause sometimes to know what, I, what I'm actually really talking about. So when, we, when you were talking about um, you know, superintendent evaluations or anyone's evaluations, this is the point that I was trying to get at is that here is this, this is just an overlay of what the actual rubric looks like. I, I didn't put all of the indicators. So you have these four columns. Here are your four standards. And under those standards are what's called indicators. And each of those indicators, you know, have different uh, descriptions underneath them. And then there's an element. So if you're just even looking in the first column, you have curriculum planning, there's an A, and under A there's one, two, three. Now I, I have two things highlighted because I'll explain what some of the changes are, but you'll see that there are these extra elements that are underneath there, and that's what it looks like in the rubric. So teachers and administrators are rated on a four-point scale, so exemplary to unsatisfactory. 
and I have highlighted in there that educators need to be proficient or exemplary in standards one and two to get these ratings. So for example, let's just say um, in standard one you had proficient and then you had a needs improvement in standard two, you cannot get an overall rating of proficient. So you have to make sure that those two are there. So that's why I wanted to highlight that. And this is the part that I was talking about, about the elements. So you have the standard, you have an indicator, but then within the rubric, this is just a little excerpt of subject matter knowledge. This is the language that's used, and this is what people use to actually you know, do the evaluation. Or, and then we'll talk a little bit about SMART goals, too, um, and how teachers are writing those. So this basically determines your educator plan. So there's one-year plans, and that's typically your, um, your teachers that are non-PTS. And then most teachers are on a two-year self-directed growth plan. So they have year one and year two with their goals, and they talk about their steps. I don't typically have to get it too deep into the needs improvement on satisfactory um, here in Chelmsford, but those two sections would be next if teachers are not performing um, at that piece. And what will end up happening is all your, all your PTS, non-PTS teachers will be on a developing educator plan. And basically what that means is that you work closely with your evaluator to come up with your goals. And you know, it's not, we would want to make sure that we're, the goals are actually matching what the expectation is in Chelmsford. And like I said, most of our teachers are on a self-directed growth plan that goes for two years. And then a directed growth plan would be if you were unsatisfactory and an improvement plan if you were unsatisfactory. So that's the breakdown of how those goals go. So if teachers came up short on their expectations, what kind of tools are offered to them to make them better teachers? What kind of, I'm sorry, did you say pools? Uh, tools. Oh, pools. <laughs> pools. Um, There's pool. Right, so, uh, it, Again, in a, in a perfect world, if you take this, this whole evaluation tool, this is you know, my, my opinion and how I feel, my philosophy towards it. it. It's really kind of your job description, right? If you look through, there's everything that's in there. The feedback piece should be part of the tools to help you to be effective. And even if somebody's writing this on a piece of paper, it's really that conversation that goes back and forth with the teacher and that collaboration. So what typically happens, especially your new teachers, um, or even teachers that are like, I'm not sure what I want to be doing. Everything's based off of your strategic plan, your district goals, and your school improvement plan. So it's not this arbitrary, strange thing that just suddenly comes um, together. But a lot of the teachers will work collaboratively with the, their evaluator, the department coordinator, principal, and their team to come up with team goals. Because if they're all working towards the same thing, you have at least some other people to rely on. And one of the biggest things when we talk a little bit about uh, SMART goals is not only the rigor, the R of SMART, it's the realistic. I mean, is this realistic that you can get this done? I've had some people that uh, have come to me and they're like, I'm gonna do this, this, and this. I'm like, I don't know how you're gonna do it. Um, so let's, let's back it up and let's make sure that we're doing something well. So part of the tools is working collaboratively. We, um, in the beginning, I know that when we started these things, we did what I, I like to call the road shows. We went around to all the schools, because we were all building this and sailing it at the same time. Because the same things happened with the administrators. We're like, well, what exactly are we doing here? So I think at this point, teachers have a good idea that have been here or have been in another district of what the process is, but we do offer that time together. I know that um, HR has been going to the schools um, doing that road show piece because we do have an evidence submission coming up for your non-PTS teachers. So to help them through that, not only through this, but how to use TeachPoint, right? Because TeachPoint's its own, you know, beast that goes with it. And, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about it is uh, we did work uh, two or on year three of this now where we looked at um, focus elements so I mean so focus indicators so when we first did this I mean it was ridiculous we did so there's all this is 16 um, indicators and then the elements that are underneath it people were passing in I'm not kidding you like 40 to 50 pieces of evidence I'm like what well, does that prove that you were really good at submitting stuff so we worked together <coughs> with uh, on the evaluation team on the teacher side, administrator side, and even CAA picked up on this too, is let's focus in on this thing. So what is a well-structured lesson? Because your idea of it might be different than your idea. So let's work on that. And we're still working on it. This is going to take some time. And as an admin group, we're actually going to take a step back as a whole group and really start looking at good instructional practices to make sure that we know what we're talking about. So it's not one person's doing it this way and that way. So there's a lot that happens. Um, and many of us, like even myself, I'm like, feel free to reach out to me. I don't necessarily oversee the evaluation piece anymore, like the, the whole process, except for the people I evaluate. But 
you know, give me a shout, I'll be more than happy to brainstorm that. And teachers have also shared their goals. So those who you evaluate and Dr. Lang evaluates, mm -hmm. are they also, is it a, a different teach point scale? Same? No. The only difference is in standard two, there's a little bit more of the management pieces, like budgeting, you know, mm -hmm. things that a teacher wouldn't have. But it's all within the same, it's the same thing. And so they provide evidence for every standard. And you can so them. they're doing the focus standards too and I'll talk a little this is where it gets complicated so a PTS a non PTS teacher will be submitting evidence starting in January because they're in their first year S teachers that are on the one to two year you're either one of one or one of two they'll submit their evidence in April so I'll explain what that looks like when we get to that point but we're all doing this together I have evidence I have but to submit evidence, evidence for goals three and four. S say it again this many evidence for goals three and four. I mean that they're submitting evidence. What they have to do is they have to submit evidence for their goals, mm -hmm. all right, the steps that they adhere to, and the different indicators that are the focus indicators. Now, if your goal happens to be a focus indicator, great. Yeah, you just, you, you, you got, you know, it's almost like a, a double dip, but that's one way to do it. So they'll, and in year one, for those teachers that are on the two-year plan, they'll submit evidence towards that in year one, and then what they did differently in year two, right? Can I ask, I, I so Al doesn't have to sorry. ask, yep. what's PTS? Oh, so professional it's teaching status. Right. <laughs> so after, it, you know, it's, it's one of the regulations. So after three years, a teacher would earn professional teaching status. And that's just three years of and working in a district. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was going to say you could answer that. It's wor it, working in a district. There's, that's different from okay. having a professional teaching license. It's three years of working in a district. Gotcha. You'll see that a lot of the words are the same words. We talk about formative assessments and formative evaluations. I mean. God forbid we come up with different words to, to identify that. So oh, they go just, through this. Excuse me. Oh, I sorry. just wanted to say that um, it is an incredibly rigorous process. And so even though um, I know for me that my evidence won't be submitted till later in the spring, I'm collecting now. Um, we try to encourage that so it's not this overwhelming task in April of like a project, the school Absolutely. project, right? I think um, for your developing educator plans too, I believe that they have mentors who are not evaluative but right. supportive in terms of helping them to yeah. Uh, make sure that they're doing what they need to be doing in terms of instruction and um, you know meeting the standards yeah. um, so that's another level la level I can't talk yeah. level of support Barbara that um, that new teachers may have is, is their mentors yeah we encourage team goals and I will tell you a lot of teams work together especially you know like right now we're working with I ready there is a big push on that as a goal right and so and, and but there is you know also room for that individual piece too and in some of yeah. the other uh, well, even in, so you have a student learning goal and then you have a professional practice right. goal. Your professional practice goal doesn't have to relate to your student learning goal. It could be something specific for you. And then with regards to the directed and improvement plan, mm -hmm. um, once if it was determined that a teacher needed either one of those, then that kicks in another process um, around, and I, I could be yep. wrong, but timelines and whatnot, yep. um, you know, certain- Specific goals, specific, specific goals, actions, exactly, steps, action steps. Um, and meetings and everything. All of it, yes. So I don't know if that answers your question. I so. just wanted to make sure that if someone is found lacking in a certain area, we're providing- that Yeah, that's, that's a whole, like, uh, this whole other system that kind of kicks in. We're yes, absolutely. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I can speak to that a little bit. I mean, that's the, that was really the intent of the evaluation tool. It's not a, hey, got you for not doing something. At, at any point, if somebody is not succeeding, you should provide support, right? And then if you've so provided everything and someone just is not able to do the work, then that's a whole different story. But it's not a, I'm going to wait until you don't do something so that I can talk to you about Who it. Who provides the support? We would. It depends on what the support is. So, for example, if a teacher is struggling, let's just say, I don't know, classroom management, yeah, perfect. Um, they might be, um, whether they're working with another teacher, they might be offered PD. I might get a phone call saying, can you help us find someone to help a coach, right? I might want to send one of the coaches in. Yeah, coaches. Yep, math coaches. We have a writing coach. Special so, they, again, teachers. people that are not mm -hmm. evaluating, but we know who, like, our master teachers are. And sometimes it's just as simple as, like, um, you know, teaching them that like a number system of how to get your kids up so they're not all, you know, diving to the door at the same time. And I know that might sound silly to some people, but it's it's a it's a it's a skill that teachers have to learn. And um, even just uh, how to, you know, do your exit tickets properly. So sometimes it's quick and to the point, but then other times it's literally like I might have to send them on a, a workshop. Right, and your other, at the other end, and I know you're gonna get to this, um, your exemplary teachers mm -hmm. are the ones who are acting as um, uh, models for um, really good 
um, instructional practices. And so they're acting as mentors to? Uh, well, they can models. apply to be a mentor. Yeah. So teachers have yeah. to apply to be a mentor. Right. So, you know, you don't you're not You're not assigning them as <laughs> yes, a mentor. No, no, no. You're a model. Someone. So they might be a class that you might go and observe in, for yeah. example. So you would send one of these teachers into a class to watch the <laughs> math. <laughs> it, it, there's some nuances with that. I mean, you can't just say, okay, Al, you're exemplary. Now go into Donna's class and tell her how, how to do it. I mean, somebody would be, that's, that's a lot. It's hard to yeah. go into someone's classroom. So there's a couple of things that can happen. I mean, we, we know who has, like, kind of the finesse to, to work with teachers. I mean, because nobody wants to come to work and not do a good job. If they have a mentor, that's the first person we go to. We have a mentor coordinator. We talk to that person. Hey, what's been going on? How's it been working for them? They might need some more support from their mentor. It might be a teammate. It could be a coach. So, so you're, you're not going to gonna send a group of master or teachers into another classroom with a checklist. Nope. And nope, nope, say. Nope, nope. That's know. learning. Learning walks are different, but learning walks are non-evaluative too. And I could do a whole section on that. But we're trying to get that up and running. We have administrative learning walks. I did put an all call out. Now, granted, it was the beginning of the school year. And I had, you know, uh, high expectations for teachers to join a committee to start talking about what does that look like for you. Like, I would love for the high school teachers to see how it works at the mm -hmm. elementary level and middle with high and just trying to get those relationships going. Sometimes um, we have teachers that can run like multi-part series or PD sessions. If that person is a good person, like it, it can be a high school person working with a middle school person. It doesn't have to be your department. It doesn't have to be specific to who you work with. It's, it's what works. And the, so you want to make sure you provide them with that support and you don't overwhelm them at the same time. Are there area districts that use that? That use what? That. Yes. Yep. The yeah. learning watch, you mean? Yes. Yes, yes. And that's hard because everybody loves to do them. They may not want you to come into their classroom. Right. It's, it's a fear factor. No I did my whole dissertation be, yeah, on no it. One wants you can to pull that judged. up on ProQuest if you right. are bored this weekend you want to read about it. So um, it is, it's, most yeah. of it's the fear factor. Absolutely. And I think the questions that you're asking are great. And I think it really highlights how uh, complicated all of this is. I mean, there's just so many different elements right. um, that have to it, be it's considered. A, in the medical field, this is a practice. Like, if you go and look at a lot of the research that's out there, it tends to be more in, you know, the, the medical field because that's how they learn. Right. Mm -hmm. And I hope... Doing their, their rounds. Right. And I hope that one, one thing that people will take away is, is that, uh, um, that th there is a, a, you know, because this is a very complicated process and there's a lot of work that teachers have to do on their part, in terms of you know identifying um, what it is the you know what they want to work on their goals and whatnot and then collecting the evidence, um, sometimes it, you know doing the research to if it, it that happens to be the goal that you know you pick that you know you need supporting uh, research and whatnot, um, and so it really does hold teachers to a, a, a new standard. Of yeah, performance. before you had your evaluation right. in and out. Right, that was it. So they have their individual performance goals. They Correct. They have team performance goals. Does anyone review the team performance goals? The, the evaluator does. Okay. You have to be prepared to, you know, you're not going to just say for one person to do it and not the other. It should be a solid team goal. They can accept that, but if they have a specific goal, they can work on that too. As long as it's a, a, you know, a district goal and it ties to a district piece, then yes, they can, you know, go off and do an individual, mm -hmm. not with everybody else. The reason we encourage that is because it just makes sense and it gives you just that extra support system of what did we say we would do? Yeah, it can really enhance the practice And it can be a fluid document. Team. I mean, just because you write down these are my five steps, if you get to that step and it's not, you're not doing well, guess what? Let's have a conversation around it because maybe it looked good on paper, but in reality it was a hot, it was a mess. So it really... You don't want to keep making different documents, but we can change things as we yeah. go along. People change their grade levels too, and you know you're right. not going to say, "Oh, you still have to do that high school goal when you're now a kindergarten teacher." It's, just, it's not going to work. Thank okay, you. so there is a five-step. It's a whole process because it should be recursive as you go along. So, you know, every educator is <laughs> participating on their own evaluation. It should be participation. The only time it really does get that directive is if you are in that unsatisfactory or needs improvement piece. Um, that's when it becomes directive. But it should be part of uh, a, a group together. But this is one of the most important parts. It's the self-assessment. And this is an easy part to try and skip because you're like, oh, whatever. Um, I know what I need. But it's actually one of the most eye-opening things because it makes you take pause, stop, and look what you're actually doing. So what you'll do is you'll typically take the, uh, the actual rubric itself and just go through it. You know, circle some of the things. So here's just a little clip of what the actual piece of the rubric looks like. 
And it's okay to rate yourself needs improvement because you might not know about it because that could be a goal. <coughs> that's, that's important. I know that when I first even started this job, I was like, I have no idea even what that is. I'm totally unsatisfactory. So you have to just, you know, you have to be okay with yourself. And this is not graded. It's okay. You, you do it, you go through it, and it helps you make that decision. And then the other big part is that it should be based, like, so your student learning goal shouldn't be based on data. You know, you can't just come up with an arbitrary piece. Even a new teacher to our district that doesn't necessarily know the data, we do have historical data, and that's where it's good to work with the team. Historically, our students are unable to do this. So what kind of lessons are we going to develop and kind of talk about as a team? So this is just, I mean, these are just little examples that I have in here. This is not exactly the data, but we have plenty of data to work with to make sure that we can actually monitor how the students are doing and not wait till the end and find out that they can't do that. And then the next step, and again, these are all things Chelmsford does now, so nothing has changed. So then it's the goal setting and the development, right? So you come up with your SMART goal, your professional practice goal. It has to be aligned to your standards and in your district goals. And basically, as we go through the whole SMART piece, it has to have all of these elements in it that make sure that it's a goal that can actually be done. The bigger parts being obviously time uh, bound and tracked. It has to have some type of action to it. So this is just a quick example of one. I know I have a lot of arrows going on, but if you were to Teachers, you know, I want to communicate better. I want to, you know, I want to talk to parents. I want to have them in. That's not a goal because we don't, you know, it sounds great, but you don't know how you're going to get it done. This makes you stop and take a look of how you can actually work with, the, you know, your students or your parents to get to that piece so it has all the elements of SMART in it. And we, we give them, like, I even have this little, um, I know it sounds silly, but it's like a little rubric, like fill in the blank. What are you going to do after you've seen that? So you do know your, your 10th grade students want to, you want them to do better in math. Well, what exactly do you need them to do? Look at the domains, look at the standards that they have, and make sure it's something that they actually need help with, not, not something that you already know that they can do. So just an example, department goal for mathematics. So these are, this percentage piece here, this is like a state this was an example of a state, one that was given to us, and the state determined the percentage. So we wanted those students to increase in their ability to have number sense. So the math department goal is there, but then the teachers are not, even though we do have MCAS, when they do their student learning goals, it has to be on one of our benchmarks because you're not going to have your MCAS data and all of that information, so you need to know how students are doing like in real time. So you can switch that goal to be a SMART goal using your current data to see how your students are doing. And again, like you see 80%, you see 100%. Somebody, let's say they were at 78%. Nobody's, nobody's going crazy over that. It's more of, did you do your action steps to get to it? Great. Well, guess what? Maybe the goal wasn't realistic at that point. But as long as you're working towards getting to that point, it shouldn't, it, you should not really run into any issues. And again, you can adapt it as you go along. Okay, so in Chelmsford here, because we like to do things a little bit more, you can make your SMART goal a little bit smarter, and if you add the rubric language to it, it makes it crystal clear what you're trying to get to. So one of the exercises we have you know, teachers go through, and again, it's not mandatory, is it's helpful more, I think, for the newer teachers is, okay, so what part of that rubric are you really getting to? If you said you're gonna do well-structured lessons, well, what exactly are you doing for that well-structured lessons? And this, the underlying pieces you see here, that is, ex that is rubric language. So it just, it just bounds that goal a little bit tighter to ha so you're very clear as to what you're working on. So then you get to obviously step three of it and you're actually implementing the plan. And this is where we talked a little bit about, don't wait until the end. Uh, monitor your plan as you go along, start collecting your data that you have. There's observations that will start to happen. So take that information little by little, then waiting to just, you know, the compliance piece of let's get it done and I'll just pass in what I have. If you really, it, it, the, the part of the goal too is to take a step back and be reflective. It's hard to do when you're, you know, you know on that, that treadmill and you're going, it's, this is the part where people need to take a step back. So it is important to have a very specific goal that's focused on some type of element that you know you want to increase. So when we're talking about those goals, we want quality, not quantity, okay? Anybody can pass me in thousands and thousands of pieces of paper, bring me in all sorts of things, it just means nothing. Although when it comes to like say like a lesson plan, show me some student work around it. Where do the students do? How are they doing? So as you're doing this and you go along, collect that data, upload it, and off you go, and then you can be reflective about it. And I talked a little bit earlier that Chelmsford um, works together to just come up with these focus 
indicators rather than try to do the whole thing. Now, we, we can do the whole thing. You can be evaluated on the whole thing, but let's get some of these things right. And it has been, like I said, at least three years that I can remember. Um, it's taking a while, but that's how long some of these things take. And then obviously your observations come. So this is, again, these complicated pieces, but I, I'll just go over it with you. If you are a non-PTS teacher, so that means in your usually your first three years of uh, teaching, <clears throat> you will get the whole evaluation tool. You're on a one-year plan. So you're going to have the six to 10 unannounced observations. You're gonna pass in a formative assessment for artifacts to get some feedback mid-year rather than waiting to the end of the year. You will have a full announced observation and that's how we've always remembered evaluation. Somebody says, I'm coming in on this date. I wanna you know, see X, Y, and Z. And they watch the whole class. You do a pre and a post uh, um, uh, conference and that's the full thing. And then they'll pass an evidence at the end. So they do everything truncated in one year but if you look at what the, the goal was, you should be checking on these people in their first three years so they don't fall through the cracks, so they don't fall apart and get them the PD or the help that they might need. And then you have the formative, see this is where they like to use the word twice. So a formative assessment is for a non-PTS teacher in January slash February, because they submit in January, you write it up by February, to give them feedback on their goals and their action steps and those focus elements now before it gets to June and they find out that they're really, you know, floundering. So teacher, those teachers will be working to get that evidence. You might hear them saying, what do I do? That's when they're uploading to TeachPoint and taking a, a look at what they actually do as a classroom teacher for what their um, goal is and they upload it and then they'll get some feedback and there'll be those conversations. And then a formative evaluation is for a non-PTS teacher who's on a two-year um, plan, like they do the two-year goal, it's in year one. The formative evaluation, the summative evaluation, the exact same evaluation. It's just you're getting formative in year one, how are we doing towards the two-year goal? And then you'll get your summative of how you did in two years on that goal. And then that unannounced observation, like I said, usually happens before May 1st, and it's a full-on, you know, pre-observation, full classroom observation and post-observation, and they go through the process and connect it to their standards. And at the end, everybody receives a summative evaluation at the end of their evaluation. I like to call it evaluation cycle because it's either a one or a two year. This is just a cursory of like what, this is a, a generic timeline. We set the timelines with the evaluation committee as to what the exact date's gonna be because some of them fall on a Saturday, some of them fall on a vacation. I don't like the word struggling educators because that just assumes some, something's not wrong. It should be, you know, educators in need of support, something nicer, but this is basically your non-PTS teachers and then proficient and exemplary educators with professional teaching status, they will have their timelines that go through and again, we'll set those exact dates and send that out to the, you know, the whole staff. So at the end of the day, this should be a recursive project, a process where everybody is getting together and talking about it. <clears throat> it's hard, I'll be honest with you, it all sounds well and good, but at the end of the day, when you're trying to, you know, do your job, you know, put out fires here and there, try and help people through things, it, 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 it's easy to, you know, negate those conversations. But that's the big push of go have a conversation, talk about it. I learned more from talking to someone than, you know, a piece of paper that they handed me. So what's new? <laughs> Changes to the evaluation rubric. So I alluded to it in the first overview. All they did was they took that, uh, those two um, elements of three and four under standard one and they're combining it. So you should have well-structured units and lessons. They shouldn't be, hey, here's this great unit design, but I can't teach it. They really should be going hand in hand. And then they added this new student learning indicator and this is about you know how they, how they feel in school and about learning. So a lot of that SEL piece is coming forward and then they made changes to the evaluation language. Now, this is all stuff that we're not doing in Chelmsford now. So these are the changes in the actual rubric. We'd have to sit down with, with, the, um, with the CFT, negotiate it, make sure that this is, everybody's on board. And to be honest with you, people haven't got to this point. It's because of everything else that's going on. So we're gonna have to understand it ourselves on both ends. But I looked at all of them and I gave you that extra document, which it has all that 14 page document from Desi, which summarizes everything. 
it's really making sure that, they're cha that the language is specific because it was a little vague here and there, especially when you get to that exemplary proficient. I'll tell you, it's a lot of hurt feelings because it's, you know, you know it models it. Now it's, you know, it, they change it to like what you're doing to model it because people are like, well, I thought I modeled it. I, I talked to a couple of people. Well, that's not modeling it. Did you present it to your department? I don't know. Did you do it at a conference? So that, ex and, and in my opinion, the exemplary proficient piece just, like I said, gave bad feelings. At the end of the day, we really needed an in-between with our evaluation tool of, you know, you have your proficiency, a needs improvement, because the old evaluation tool was um, met, met the goals, uh, no, met um, recommendation and didn't meet it. So you were either do or die. That was it. You had no options. So if they just kind of came up with the needs improvement, it would be better, but it is what it is. We own it and we try to do the best we can with it. So these are some of the just excerpts from that larger document that I gave you to show you what they're talking about, this little crosswalk that Desi has put out. And again, like I talked about, they, they're combining some of those elements in standards one and also in three, where it's making sure that the students are, you know, instead of two-way communication, they're culturally proficient too. They're not forgetting about, you know, our L students and those parents and those families that may not be connected to schools how do you connect them into the schools? So what Jesse has done so far is they have obviously the table with the visuals on there and identify where the changes occurred and then an explanation. And this is, this is the next steps and the work of what we have to do as a group. But is it going to be detrimental to what people are doing in their classrooms right now? No. This is not life-threatening. Students will still show us up to school. We will teach them and, and, and we will continue to you know, evaluate that and see how we're doing as, as a whole. And as you can see from our data, just even that data that we did tonight, our students, are, 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 we're doing a, a really nice job. And I, this person looks like their head is hurting, so I picked it specifically for the question because this is a lot of information. I'm sure when you saw the packet, you thought, whoa, what, what is all of this? But this is the work that we do, and, you know, I'm open to any questions you might have. Okay, any questions? I, I live it. You know, I hate to say it, but I love it too. Like, people are like, what's the matter with you? I'm like, I don't know. I just feel like at least there's a job description. I can have a conversation about what we're talking about. It gives me a framework. That's all. Well, I'm not saying it changes how I would have been able to do it in the past, but it's just so nice to know, like, yeah, yeah, you can do these things. And to also sit back myself and say, oh, I don't even, I don't even do that. Should I be doing that? How do I do that? I think Donna said live it, not love it. <laughs> oh, I think you should love it. <laughs> oh, I love it. Okay, sorry. You live it, I love it. <laughs> Tool, pool, love, live. Yeah. yeah. And there the is, same thing. I love and there is the compliance piece because you do need something, you know, to, to have to go back. So we do use TeachPoint, and that's where the, you know, part of the communication happens, and that's where we house everything. So evaluations take place throughout the course of the year. Yep. Same with administration mm -hmm. evaluations. They mm -hmm. take place throughout the course of the year. So while administrators are evaluating, they're also being evaluated. Correct. Okay. Yeah, who are the evaluators at different levels? Um, so it's, it's, well, it's a com combination. So you have um, principals who uh, evaluate the assistant principals. You have central office staff that have their group. So I do all the department coordinators. Jay evaluates all of us at the central office level. Um, Amy <coughs> Reese will do the, the chair people um, at, the, at the schools and, and works with them. Who else do we have? So that's the principals. Because it's everybody, there's, remember there's different units. So you have your A unit and then you have your B unit of the CAA. So there they have evaluators and then I have an evaluator. How about like the curriculum coordinators? Are they evaluators? Yes, I, I evaluate the curriculum no, coordinators. Who do they, do they evaluate? Yes, they evaluate teachers. Okay. So the principals and the correct. Yeah, they kind of they, they share them. Split okay. It's a shared load. Okay. So sure. oftentimes you'll find, um, you know, one or the other. Either a principal will be a primary, and curriculum coordinators may be um, contributing, or vice versa, depending on uh, just kind of sharing the load okay. of um, teachers. But usually within the buildings, the principals, and now we have the assistant principals too at the elementary level, but also at the middle school level, like deans at the high school, they all share kind of a teaching load of responsibilities. It's a lot. And often of, they're yeah, paired up. It's a lot up, of reports. You know? Yeah, because yeah, not just you don't just check. You have to write. You know. Yeah, you have to write. There's lots things. Of, it's yeah. narrative. The writing. teachers know who their evaluators yep. are. They, they do have to listen. And then we try to mix it up a little bit too. Like, because after a while, I, I may have seen the same people right. over and over. I might want. Well, I can't for the coordinators. I have no choice they're there. But when I was the coordinator for English, I would work with like say the deans or the middle school principals to say, all right, I've seen these people over and over. Why don't you do it? Or the other thing that can happen too is. 
um, at the building level, a coordinator may not know what's happening. Like, let's say, for example, someone's not coming to work. You know, they're not looking every day to see who's there. They would have to work with the principal if there's that problem. So they'll call them in, or if there's a content issue, and it's not the primary evaluator or the principal's content area, and they're not sure, is this person really teaching, you know, on a manapia? Is that what it is? I mean, I'm being facetious now. but. I would then say, you know, if I was a principal, I'd be like, can you come in and just see if what I'm seeing is correct to help me out with that? One of the first things that we have to do at the beginning of the year is you have to sign a form and it lists at the top who your evaluators will be. It's in, it's in Teach Point. Yeah. So it lists it very clearly who will be in to, to see you. And it can be, you know, more than one person. Yep. So. Yeah, the building principals have to be on every, because it's their building. I mean, that's, you know, every form, yeah. building principals. There's a couple things um, I also wanted to ask about. Mm -hmm. I believe that some of um, what it is, um, some of the, not the language in Teach Point, um, but uh, some of this is tied to teachers' contracts. Yes. Okay. So yes, this has to be negotiated. So right. everything in here is based on the okay. contract. So I want to make sure that we, we <coughs> yeah, mentioned you can't that. just throw something in there and just say this is what we're going to do without a con you know, conversation right, exactly. or you around so, it. Um, so that there is input from, yep. the, um, from the different um, uh, groups. Yeah, because when it first came out, it was adopt, adapt, or come up with your own thing that we're going to do it. So Chelmsford, when it first came out, I know it was like a few adaptions. Right. And then the other is, a lot of times we will hear people say, um, well, teachers are protected by tenure. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, that that doesn't really, that's not, this eliminated that. <coughs> Yeah, and I would think, I mean, I don't know if you want to talk about it, I think yeah. in any, I mean, any evaluation tool, I guess you could evaluate someone. Ten, I think tenure, as you traditionally kind of heard about, yeah. um, did go out, um, right. you know, some years back, a lot of time when this new evaluation system came along to play. A lot of people now have the connotation in their mind of the PTS, the professional teacher status, where new teachers to the district um, typically are on, they can almost consider like annual renewals yep. for the first three years of their teaching. And then the, the first day of their fourth year, technically they have professional teacher status, which um, just provides another level of like statutory protection mm -hmm. if you were ever going to dismiss a teacher for cause. Um, in the evaluation system though, uh, whether someone is a professional status teacher or a non-professional status teacher, you have all of those different um, kind of ratings. And even if you're a 20-year teacher, um, if you're put on an improvement plan, there's a prescribed kind of timeline and, and process that has to be followed. Uh, or at the end of the process, if, if improvement hasn't been uh, witnessed, you know, you may be let go. Um, so if, if that's kind of the connotation of tenure that some people have in mind. Right. Um, no, it, it, again, it doesn't happen often. But a veteran um, teacher who is not performing um, may, you know, be removed. It's just a very prescribed process. Yes. And as Linda alluded to, and you did a really nice job putting it all together, the, um, all of this is basically incorporated into the collective bargaining agreements. So the, the context, is, it's a very prescribed process that talks about, you know, number of evaluations and what you have to provide and all these different things. That is actually in each individual contract. So even though the DOE might make some recommendations for language changes, mm -hmm. we still have to kind of figure out how they would fit in when it's appropriate and then actually negotiate that with the different uh, employee groups. Absolutely. And I think that the only reason I bring this up is just because um, I think that it's important for people to understand that, uh, you know, teachers are constantly uh, self-evaluating and being evaluated. Huh. And that if you're not doing what it is that you need to do um, in terms of the instruction and the other um, standards, um, that, that you, know, you, you would go on this improvement plan. And if you were a 20-year teacher and you weren't, um, you know, meeting the expectations, then, then you could be let go. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no just staying on forever and ever and ever, even if you're doing a horrible job, if you're not meeting um, the expectations set forth in on a yearly or um, yeah. every two years yeah. basis in terms of the goals and the standards. And those expectations are required of administrators as well as teachers. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes. It's the same process. And they have the same, I mean, administrators also have professional status <coughs> after three years. Yeah. Um, but if an administrator is in the district for longer than three years, they also can be on an improvement plan. So when we did your evaluation mm -hmm. back in the summer, it had these standards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They would just have more of the management, but like right. said, the right. standards the are pretty much the same, but they just um, uh, based on the few other elements that we would do that a classroom teacher And we use the do. same rating system. Yeah. Same rating system. And, uh, yeah, and, and you know, uh, uh, like a superintendent level, it's, you know, orchestrating all of that stuff. I mean, he's not going in and teaching 
the lesson, unless he's going in for an invited thing or, you know, impromptu, but it's making sure that the lessons are being taught, that we do have some way to assess students on funding sources so that, you know, we can do the, the work that we need to do. Right, so the budget, all of these things are evidence a that we would it, use. Correct. A right. lot of it's job specific Right. when you get outside of like a classroom teacher because the DOE was actually doing, maybe you can allude to this, but mm -hmm. like um, we'll work on say like um, school councils, like guidance councils or nurses yeah. and things like that that aren't your traditional teacher that don't have kids in front of them all day long, how they were really, but they, they didn't fully complete that. No, they uh, didn't. So, they, they almost so we have the SISP stopped. rubric, and that is for like your guidance counselors, your nurses. Right. So there is that. But then they really were starting to drill, drill it down to the, here's a nursing rubric. Because, I mean, what's a well structured lesson? I mean, is it <laughs> how you're sick? Let's talk about <coughs> being sick. I mean, they're not going to do all of that. They're going to address the issue. And then a, a counselor, which is really difficult to do, is that you, you're developing a relationship with that student and they may be telling you things and then what, is some arbitrary person gonna sit in there? You lose that counseling piece. So they were really looking at, well, what does this look like for a guidance counselor to be able to actually evaluate? Sure, you can do a lesson on when you have the parents come in for like a, a college night, but when it came to like almost that therapy piece, that's that's tricky. Same with nursing. I mean, you're talking about people's private, plus I don't know if I want to evaluate some kid as a nurse when the kid's throwing up. I think I'm all set. It looks like you're doing a great job. You know, that, that's hard to do. So you really want to find out what is it that a nurse really does? What's their responsibility? Is it, you know, the, the logging of the medication and stuff? So I think also what has happened is I think they've cleaned up some of the language around the evidence piece. Yes. Um, so for example, um, around um, uh, family involvement and communication, um, I could submit one email that would show that I was doing a great job. But did but, you do it consistently? Right, but did I do it consistently? <laughs> you told but, the, but I was only required to submit one you know, artifact. So to now judge you on consistently, you do a range. Like exactly, a log. That's and that's I, exactly what they're asking for like a for communication now. log. Yes. So I could look yes. at that log, and I know that these people were contacted. This is how they like. That's what I would recommend if you're going right. to go communicate. It has to be now. It has. To, you're exactly right. right. It has to be this same, range. In the no. same sense, you're, you know, you're saying well, some people are submitting too much evidence. We're telling them to pull it back. Right. How do they know that they shouldn't be pulling back on that? They should be pulling back on lesson plans. I well, don't know. and, and this is the goal, yeah. right? So right. the goal says, you know, based like so that one. If I can go back to it, which says based on my communication log, it would say emails to parents, and then underneath. So here's your goal. Underneath that is your action step. So I might say in the fall, I will submit uh, two newsletters and email communications and something else. So you, that's you break it down that way. And then in the spring, so we try to break it down, you know, fall, winter, spring. Does it just make sense? It's, it's hard to put, like, by, you know, October 31st, I'll have this. Try to keep it uh, in a range, and then they should be submitting that, and you'll see the evidence of when they contacted parents and everything else. Right, and I, should, I didn't mean range. I actually meant yeah. chain, a chain of communication mm -hmm. now as opposed to one email. Right. Um, um, I was going to say just one other thing, too, um, and I think that this has been an important, I think, that to help kind of clean this up and, and uh, show more thematic kinds of things as opposed to just episodic in terms of the evidence that we mm -hmm. submitted. Um, the other thing too is, um, and I'm not sure about this in terms of the uh, teacher contracts, but uh, sometimes it will even state how many pieces of evidence you can submit per, like I, yeah, we I, have that. Yeah, ours is the whole yeah. kit and I was gonna say, you're not usually limited to providing too much evidence. It usually will say you're required to do X number of pieces right. or X artifacts right. um, to, to uh, pass in. So it's another reason. A lot of that really, yeah, right. but a lot of it is, it all hits back to the communication piece. Right. You have to be talking with your evaluator and hopefully when evaluators are sitting down with teachers or whatever the role is, you're being very upfront and honest about what your expectations are and what you're looking for. Um, we honestly don't see a lot of um, confusion no. about that in the process. I think the, the people are very good about talking and setting expectations and then the um, we've really worked on um, you know less is more and yeah. you know trying to have the quality over the quantity um, you know instead of you know uh, again I, I just agree. checking yeah. all the boxes or even right. like a lesson really plan show me some student work behind it so if you show me some quality lessons and how the students did I mean I could google a lesson plan anyone could uh, all of you could do this um, sure. but what oh, and then look at that lesson plan to be like okay how could you have you know, incorporated multiple means of representation. And so, so that's, that's the conversation. And if you've submitted something, and if the evaluator is confused, 
you go to them and say, I don't, I don't, I don't know what this is. Like I had people p pass in masks once before. I'm like, this is they're beautiful. I have no idea what this is. So you know, and we you know chuckle about it, and it's like, oh, remember we you know learned about da da da. da. I'm like, oh, that's right. Help me understand what the kids do to do this. But that's again, have that conversation. And, and I and I'll say it again. It's it. This is not easy. This is not like oh, look at what we're doing. It's Shangri La. Everything's wonderful. No, sometimes it's hard and it's it's messy and. You know, you just try to you, you try to you know use that collaborative piece and 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 help each other out. And then people will call will call each other. You know, like well, I don't know what to do about this. It's like, oh, did you try this? Are I you agree with you. I, I think that this this um, definitely um, improves communication. I mean, right from the beginning of the school year uh, through the end. You have to at least meet once. Right. right? Absolutely. There, I mean, at least once, but yeah. actually several times. Right. Um, as you're going through this process. So I think that that has certainly um, uh, improved the collaboration and communication. And we've also talked about even the write-ups. I mean, you don't need to write someone a five-page paragraph, you know, five-page paper. The, it, you know how you were saying, I like less is more? Maybe it's it's better you need bullets, you know, bump, 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 bump. And we've talked about even with our, I know one of the things that the teachers really were concerned about or they just didn't understand is my writing style is different to, than others, other people. So as a group, we try to come up with, you know, try and give a piece of, you know, make a claim, give the evidence, give a recommendation, ask a question. So, like, we had these four elements to at least, you know, kind of latch on to so people didn't feel like, well, somebody wrote me a sentence. I mean, well, somebody wrote me, you know, 300 pages, and I, I don't have time to read that. So if you really want it to be meaningful feedback, it should be, you know, quick hits, something that they can turn around and do in their classroom the next day or next week. Is T point, Teach Point the only game in town? Is it a monopoly? We have to use Teach Point. No, it's just, there's, they're all kind of clunky. There's, um, there was the Oasis once before. Some people did it. We originally did it on with Word documents. That was a mess because then I was also housing my stuff. So if I disappeared, I took all my stuff with me. So there's not a lot of them out there, but they're all the kind of the same point. Like here's this evidence submission. Here's the way that you can do your forms. You can add PD to it. You can add all sorts of things. So I, I haven't yeah, found one that's are, like fantastic. All a little funky. There's like three or four major ones like TeachPoint. I think the bigger issue that we have with whether it's TeachPoint or like any of those software products is typically as they either get bought out or, or um, merge with other companies, they try to take on like a different life. You know, so what yeah. might have been intended to be just a teacher evaluation system, you know, if it ends up getting bought out by like say a fall or something like that. They're you know, really trying to enhance their whole student database management piece, so it becomes like an add-on type thing. And um, I think that's the biggest issue that we have with a lot of these products. They're originally good and they're intended to be something, but because companies merge and, and buy out all the time, they end up you know not remaining completely true to what they originally started to be, mm -hmm. and it kind of gets melded with whatever the, the vision of the new company is. But um, I think, you know, again, for a district outside, if you were like a small one school district or something, you could probably do some kind of homegrown system. But when you be like set to be our size, you need to have something be formalized. And there are only like three or four products out there. It's a major shift to go from like one project, uh, one product to another. Um, Teach point, I have to say, is probably one of the top <coughs> two as far as those kind of products that are out there. Um, but they're all a little clunky. And again, how, do you, it just how does Teach Point <coughs> protect the evidence that is uploaded? It's password it? protected. They have security. And systems only the around. teacher has the password to their. Evidence. Yeah, they, yeah. We, I mean, if we had to go on the back end, if somebody lost it, they, I'm sure they can go in the back end and Teach Point and get it for them. Mm. Um, but for the most part, everything's password protected and. Like so how do evaluators get to the evidence? So the, the teacher has to share it. So if you if you fill out your form, so there's a so basically it's a click of a button for a share piece. If you fill out your form and you're doing all that and you don't share it, I, I, I well, can't I get see that. it. So once it's been shared, is it shared for a period of time? No, nope, it stays shared. Oh, it stays shared. So they have access to the teacher's nope. evidence. I can't and I can't go into a teacher's form and change what they wrote. And they can't go into my form and you change can't make what specific I wrote. changes to their form, but you can delete their form. No, I can't delete their form. I don't have that because I can't go even into their form and write, you know, you know, other things like they wrote a sentence. I can't be like, no, oh, erase that. They can delete their own form. They can delete but their own form. But a second party can't delete. I can't delete your form if you if you create it and share it with me. I can't delete your form. Um, you can delete your form. The only thing that I can actually add, like if there's a box on the, your form, uh, I can't change text that you've written, but in the box where I can contribute, I can type in. Yeah, there's like a comment box. And that saves on all future versions of the form. Yeah, I, could, I mean, I could do up some mock ones, 
um, and show you actually what the system looks like and, and just like some, yeah, I would just use ones with my name on it yeah. and give you an idea of what they look like. Right, so you're asking, it's not about the forms, you're asking about what's in the forms? I'm asking about the data that the teachers upload for their evidence. The evidence. Mm -hmm. yeah. And who has access to that data and who can delete that data. No, I, the teacher can delete it. If the teacher's missing something, Teach Point usually is the retrieval piece for it, so they are the ones that found it. Like I had missed, something was missing when I first went into mine. I was like, wait, where's the such and such? They found it and they uploaded it back into my system because I couldn't even find it. So it happens where if some, like, I may. We don't, have, we don't house like the, uh, the teacher. Yeah, the we don't have the server. I know, it's on their it's server. It's all remote on their server. So if someone has to go in and actually get something, <coughs> excuse me. But they me. have to have permission. Yeah, but you have to go to the Teach Point company. Yeah, right. they like, have to they do it would, for me. I'm sure they have some right. Kind of permission we would have to proactively them. ask permission from Teach Point to to reinstate the evidence that was gone. Well, the educator themselves would. Yeah, they can talk to Teach Point too. If an educator has trouble, they have like the date and time. I don't know what kind of credentialing what, they would have to share with them, so that it was um, acknowledged that that was the person. But um, I'm sure there's something with Teach Point. Do we run any kind of audits to make sure that only people that are accessing it are? Right? Do we keep logs? Or does Teach Point? Teach Point has Teach a date and time stamp of who's Teach done what, where, when, and why, and they'll tell you. Like, it, you know, if we question something, they'll be like, "This is who was in there. This is what they did. Mm -hmm. Here's their name. Here's their date. Here's their time." Mm -hmm. Every time I um, someone goes in, that I get an email saying that. Yeah, they there is an email they alert should, system. Yeah, yeah, that they share something. Yeah, yeah. it goes. I shut mine off because I'd get the whole districts and it'd be bad. Any other questions? No. And I think as <coughs> as more comes and we will learn more about like how this is going to affect the teachers and teacher val, yeah, we'll obviously anyone... bring it to you because it'll affect negotiations and how we implement things in the future. And if anyone's interested in seeing what an actual form and stuff, what, what, what it looks like on TeachPoint, like I said, I can just, we have some, um, we even have test teachers, like fake accounts. And you can, you know, play around in it. That's how we do some of the evaluations. Like if we're all looking at the same video to do an evaluation, we all populate it in the one spot. So, again, it's, that's simple for me. It'll all have my name on it and show you what it looks like. Well, thank you for all that. Yeah, thank you for putting yeah. that together. It'd be like the guy that's scratching his head over there. Um, next item on the agenda this evening, item 7, is uh, just an update. I'm actually, uh, Dennis had alluded to this earlier in the evening. Um, last couple of weeks have been very busy when it comes to district um, safety and uh, planning preparedness. So each of our schools, as you know, over the course of this fall, we spent a lot of time uh, working on the Alice options-based response protocols in each of the buildings. Um, we had uh, staff training in September dedicated to getting the teachers on board with it. Um, we had that middle school, high school video that was shared with you some meetings ago. Um, we actually did a, a similar video, but it's more age appropriate for the elementary level. Um, so that was completed a couple of weeks ago. And we're at the point where each of our schools selected a different day um, to actually conduct their first round of drills with the um, uh, school administration, uh, central office staff was there to oversee them, um, Chief Spinney and police staff were there, and um, uh, Captain Hull from the fire department uh, was there as well because they've been working very closely with us. Um, so each of our schools picked a different day so that we weren't constrained at all by time and actually went in. I can tell you at the elementary school level, um, it was very well done. Uh, they all started with individual school assemblies. Some did them uh, whole school, some did say third and fourth grade together and then K to two together. Uh, but they actually had all the kids come in, talked exactly about what was going to happen that day. Um, she had a little video with them. Um, teachers had very um, scripted um, messages to kind of go back and talk to their kids about. And they ended up practicing the evacuation and the, um, uh, the barricading, uh, the locking down in each of the classrooms. At the elementary level, they did not practice um, the counter. But uh, they talked about that and exactly when it would uh, when it would happen. But uh, the drills went um, remarkably well. I, I really do think, and I, I thank the, the teachers and the support staff and the principals for the amount of time and effort that they've put into this. It's been uh, professionally done. It's been very um, serious, taken very se uh, taken very seriously uh, throughout the school system. And uh, again, the fact that the police chief and um, you know fire staff are actually at each of these sessions with us and kind of testing and, and checking the evacuation routes and doors and whatnot um, just shows the level of commitment that the I think the town and the schools have really put into this. It's been uh, phenomenal. Uh, so we uh, we did receive uh, very good feedback from uh, staff and parents about just how um, you know no one wants to have to be doing this. 
but you know because it is the the time that we have to um, just the level of communication that's occurred uh, so that people aren't nervous by what's going on um, the amount of preparation and planning that's taken place at each of the schools uh, again has just been very very well received I haven't received a negative comment uh, myself in the past two weeks about it so that's unusual um, but that's gone incredibly well at the same time um, you recall we contracted with uh, safe plans was the firm uh, to actually uh, help us kind of digitize a lot of our different emergency uh, plans within the buildings so we didn't plan this but uh, it had just happened that the second week of our uh, rollout of the Alice drills the um, uh, gentleman from safe plans was in the district doing our physical assessments of each of the buildings um, so three days last week we actually uh, went along with uh, him as well police and fire also sat in on some of those assessments um, they started with uh, kind of a question and answer period with each of the building administrators to talk about their existing plans, how prepared they are, um, running them through a, a bunch of scenarios, and then physically walking the interior and exterior of the buildings and really providing a third uh, party perspective on our buildings from someone. This gentleman's actually from Texas, so he, you know, he's not familiar with the Chelsea Public Schools, the layouts, but he pointed out some very interesting um, things to us. Um, he is now going back to the company and basically finalizing all the reports and sometime uh, the first or second week in January after the first of the year we'll receive the written reports and then we'll be able to actually sit down again with the police and fire departments and take a look at some of the findings and recommendations and then I'll obviously bring those to you um, this gentleman and his firm will be back out over the February vacation period um, to start the, the mapping phase of the work and also taking the interior and exterior video footage uh, that integrates into the system um, so that in the event of an emergency we can actually uh, take a look at real-time video within each of the buildings and have it be um, very well mapped uh, in, the, in the district. So that piece will happen over our February vacation. Between January and February, uh, the company is also going to start their review of all of our physical documents, so all of our like written response protocols and plans, um, so that after they come out in February, they can actually integrate this all into their new system, and hopefully we'll be up and going uh, sometime early spring. Um, we're really hoping to roll this out and we're on target to do this for the full electronic rollout uh, for the start of the next school year. A lot of this work, uh, we're going to be able to um, cite some of the physical improvements that we can work on and make over the course of the spring. Um, but we're certainly on track to have this program fully implemented by the summer in, uh, in getting into the next school year. So um, both aspects have gone incredibly well. And again, I'm very proud and appreciative of our staff for the amount of time and effort that they put into um, working on these drills and how seriously they take them now on the drills um, any special accommodations for the special education students do they have to do anything different and um, I know it's something that's come up before yeah um, they did the drills the same okay. uh, with with everyone else okay. um, again in this first round of drills the drills are going to be conducted three or four times over the course of the year in this first uh, drill again to not have it be too nerve-wracking for the kids um, uh, they kind of knew that they were either going to lock down or evacuate um, in whatever scenario they had so they kind of split the school up and one scenario would have you locking down the other scenario would have you barricading um, but it was known what your two options were going to be but all uh, special education students uh, participated in the drills they locked down or they barricaded I think the question becomes when you have the option to flee or to run if you do have um, certain populations it's a little bit more difficult and you have to just be a little more um, thoughtful about exactly how far am I from the exit is it realistic to think that I can get all of my students out of the classroom or should I barricade and lock down as opposed to trying to evacuate you always try to evacuate if you can that's the uh, safest thing is just to get away from the scene but obviously there are certain limitations that have to be taken into consideration um, but these kind of the special population staff again have taken this very seriously I think they have um, taken extra effort to kind of look around their rooms and figure out exactly what they would do in different scenarios um, but they participated right along ev with everyone else in uh, in all of these drills any other questions I just want to say um, a lot of the <coughs> parents that I hang around with a lot of the kids all went home and talked about the Alice drills too and with my daughter I mean we we had a really good conversation about how to take it seriously and to, to just follow the instructions and do what she's supposed to do mm -hmm. and I hope other parents do the same because for some of them it was like oh it was fun we ran outside and, like, it was and I'm sure the teachers tell them this is a serious thing but it should be reinforced at home and again I hope we never have to use any of these skills so to see I'll tell you I mean firsthand to see the kids in action doing the drills though 
um, you know, leaving the buildings, hands up, the whole deal. They took it incredibly seriously, yeah. even the elementary kids. And um, I could not believe how quickly some of them. We couldn't, yeah, couldn't even I, I couldn't keep up with some of the kids because, because it wasn't as orderly as, say, like a fire drill where you have to kind of, you know, crazy. these kids were allowed to kind of run if, if they had to, if they knew where they were going. Yeah. And uh, at center school, we happened, we called the drill. One wing was evacuating while the other group was um, barricading. And literally, Five seconds after the drill started, Linda and I said, all right, we're going to go down and check and see how many of these kids have gotten out. We couldn't find the kids. No, they, were like they had shot out the side gone. of the building, and they were up near Town Hall um, hiding where they were supposed to have before we could even get to their doors. It was incredible. We got outside the front of the building, and it was, we thought we were going to see them standing there, and they had, they had already taken off yeah. into the woods. So um, they did a fantastic job. They really did, and this, the students at Barricaded also did a good job. But um, just how serious they took it, um, and again, we're, we're, we're not trying to scare anyone, but we wanted to put the time into making sure that we were thoroughly doing these drills and everyone had the same information and was on the same page. Um, but it was impressive. Uh, I was really proud of the kids mm -hmm. and, the, and the teachers, obviously, mm -hmm. um, for seeing it through. So it, it couldn't have gone better. Any issues with doors or anything in terms of lockdown? You know, no, no big I mean, issues. with. I think what we're running into, and we are talking to, again, police and fire on this, is um, are there additional ways to um, lock and enhance the locks uh, within our classroom? So when we do the drills, um, several of the schools actually intentionally have the teachers not lock the door just so that we could actually test the barricade uh, because we don't want to, in a test, we don't want to break a door uh, in a hallway to get in. So we actually told them not to lock the door, but just to do their barricade so we could actually kind of test it. For the most part, they did a pretty good job. You know, there were some doors that we were able to push in, but you have to think, you know, how long is someone going to take trying to get in as opposed to just they're going to move to the next classroom. Um, but we are looking at a couple of different devices that um, some districts, not as much in Massachusetts, this is kind of a, a newer thing to Massachusetts, are implementing with um, kind of specialized locking latches at the, the bottom of the doors and things like that. Um, we're going to order a couple and actually um, kind of work with the police and the fire department um, on seeing exactly how they would work in our situation. And then uh, ideally, obviously, we'd bring this recommendation back to you once we have that full physical assessment done. We just need to work with the fire department in particular mm -hmm. as very specific building codes around what you can and can't have as far as uh, doors that lock and whatnot. So we need to find something that the uh, fire department is comfortable with before we implement. Uh, but there are some products out there. When I was at the, uh, the safety conference, um, I got a couple of great contacts. So we're actually ordering uh, just a couple of the devices ourselves now so that we can actually try them and then uh, hopefully bring some type of a recommendation forward to you once we have those physical um, assessments. Great. Now, is the state looking at funding for safety type of things? Like I know we've <coughs> kind of been out there somewhere. It's but been I talked know. about, but I have yeah. not seen anything okay. come out yet. Um, there was talk in last year's budget uh, when the, the, um, the year ended as far as um, having some of the surplus be dedicated towards uh, physical uh, enhancements of buildings, but nothing has come out no, of the okay. DOE or the, uh, the state yet on that. Um, we're obviously watching it and um, we'll look for it, but that wasn't gonna stop us from doing the assessments. Right. We wanted to be able to know what we would actually be asking for if we even had it. I have to think that our grant application, if the grant funding does come out, will actually be in a much better place because we'll have had these assessments and we can then use that as evidence and backup to be able to supply our application. So I think we're setting ourselves up incredibly well, um, and we're just kind of waiting for that funding from the funding source. And we also, if the funding, if the grant isn't out by the time we know what we're asking for, I think we then could take that proposal and start to shop it around, and you know, uh, hit our state legislature, uh, legislature, and others about trying to help us uh, work through some of these issues. Uh, some of them aren't too costly. Some of them aren't you know, really expensive to uh, be able to implement, uh, but we'll be able to between now and the winter kind of tie some uh, actual dollar figures to those. One of the things that I had talked to um, some of our representatives about was uh, the fact that there really isn't a standard, right, for that all schools must have no. for safety. And, you know, that, that we really need to think about. It's very community-based. It, it is. <coughs> and that, um, that in, in order for this, um, the uh, School Building Association to be able to offer some funding, that maybe they have to start with a standard around, you know, what every school must have mm -hmm. um, in order to be able to be considered safe in these right. situations I don't disagree with you they just don't they, I know. they don't yeah, have schools different you, know, you have some doors with wooden doors some doors have a, yep. a window you can see in some don't so uh, 
it's yep. kind of hard to it is it's key kind of look about your face and you don't want to cause another problem like okay we've done so well with fire and everything else that we suddenly cause a problem for this right. situation so I think the difference More is that come. we're not caught off guard but I think what, what's happened so far has gone incredibly well oh I agree yeah no I appreciate it it's good work okay um Next report for you. Um, we do have our October 1 numbers back from the DOE. These haven't varied greatly from the draft, um, so I actually just waited till we had our final figures. Um, this is a table that I presented to you uh, last year, and uh, just for historical sake, takes a look at all of our actual October 1 numbers that have been certified by the DOE. These are the figures that get used when we come up with Chapter 70 funding uh, for the following year. <coughs> So as you look at this, um, the top of the chart on page two just breaks down the actual grade levels in the district by school and gives you a total student, um, uh, kind of an FTE equivalent. And you'll see that uh, district-wide we're at uh, 4961 as far as pupils go. I think that's about 25 or 30 students less than uh, last year. We were just shy of uh, 5,000 last year. But um, we're remaining relatively uh, steady. You can see our um, larger numbers are starting again to work up through the elementary schools and our high school is tailing off a little bit. Um, for the middle schools and the high school, it's a little bit easier to do an actual um, classroom enrollment or a per pupil um, uh, enrollment. So each of our individual schools uh, in the second phase of the chart uh, breaks down the total number of students. Uh, how many homerooms or classrooms were, uh, we have at that grade level to then just come up with an average class size. And uh, again, if, if you look at our uh, kindergarten across the four elementary schools, um, you know, we're at a low at, at Byam, ironically, and we really uh, had been seeing much higher numbers over there of about 22 kids in a class up to um, a high of 25, 26 at uh, center. Um, that's relatively consistent in first grade at the schools. Um, again, Byam has a low of 20 and uh, center of 25, 26. Um, both South Row and Harrington are somewhat in the middle, 21, 22, 23 uh, students. We do try at the, um, the elementary grade levels to really have our numbers. Um, uh, the, the benchmark is 25 and under. Um, you know, if we can be in the 20 to 24 range, uh, that's typically what, uh, what we're, we're targeting for. Uh, second, third, and fourth grade across the district, our numbers um, uh, are slightly lower, with the exception of, again, center uh, at about 24 kids per class. The other uh, schools have uh, 20 to 22. Um, and then third and fourth grade, we have some of our uh, better class sizes of uh, you know 20 to 22 uh, students per class. Um, so those fourth graders will be shifting up to the, uh, the high school, uh, not the high school. They got to spend a couple of years in middle school. <laughs> so they're going up to middle school uh, next year. But then um, if you look uh, on the top of the second page, it just gives you a um, rough breakdown of our uh, middle school numbers that both McCarthy and Parker then you can see at um, McCarthy Middle School, uh, they actually had uh, 200 students right on the nose on October 1. Um, so they've got a 25 uh, average class size over there for our main uh, classrooms. So that takes into consideration every single student and just uh, kind of plugs them for this purpose into the equation. There are some students that obviously are not in um, uh, mainstream homerooms that might be in sub-separate programs within the building. Uh, so your actual average class sizes are, are uh, most likely uh, <coughs> slightly less, but it gives you a good indication of where we're at. And then uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade as well. Um, you know, you're looking at 19 to 22 students per class. So the, the class sizes are actually um, somewhat lower in the middle schools than they are at the elementary schools. Um, high school, when we start working on budgeting, we're working on our class size report for the high school as well. Obviously, the kids aren't, don't spend the day in homeroom, so it's not as easy to put together an average class size. Um, but historically, when we've put budgets together, um, my uh, philosophy has always been to try to have the most desirable class sizes at the lower grade levels. So to really have um, our smaller class sizes at the elementary, afford to have a couple more students at the middle, and then if we have to have slightly higher class sizes at the high school level, again, depending on leveling. Um, that that should be our goal. So we've tried to take a look at attrition when we can. Um, we're not in a situation where we really have to make uh, cuts to just make our, our budget work. But if we happen to have some attrition at the uh, high school level, past the course of the past couple of years, and even at the middle school level, we've actually um, reduced those positions and utilized them elsewhere in the budget. Um, so again, as I'm uh, preparing to put the budget together for, uh, for this year, we'll be doing the same. 
Um, but I think as a district, um, as you step back, we actually have pretty desirable class sizes compared to a lot of our neighboring communities and even our comparable districts. I think uh, we provide a very sound uh, education with, with good class sizes. And um, one of the things that we just can't control is um, just physically where people end up residing within our community because we don't have a centralized enrollment system and, ch and children end up going to school based on the neighborhood that they reside in. Um, we kept a couple of the sections of biome at five instead of four uh, because we really expected those housing developments out on Littleton Road um, to open up a little bit quicker than they have. The biome school certainly has seen some additional students from the developments um, and that's why we had been hesitant over the years. Like if you look at their um, their third grade uh, has 96 kids and we're still carrying five classes. We really were, you know, we didn't want to get in a situation where we were reduced down to four, but then all of a sudden, you know, ended up picking up 10 or 15 uh, students from the new developments. Uh, so that's just been a little bit of a um, kind of a gamble we've been taking, but we've been erring on the side of caution um, at that particular school, but it's something we're certainly going to have to watch moving forward. I was really surprised that their uh, K numbers were as low as they were. Uh, Biome's K numbers usually typically aren't that low. Um, and at one point in time, South Rose actually dropped down to third space, but South Rowe actually going into the school year had one of the higher enrollments of, of kindergarten, which um, again, we typically don't see. South Rose had pretty, um, our, our, our lowest and most desirable numbers. Um, so nothing you need to act on tonight. I just think it's helpful to have this as a point of reference as we start talking about budget, and it gives you a sense of where we're at district-wide. Um, and if people ask, sometimes the well, if you look at the, um, the per pupil counts that the DOE will put out, um, you know, 13.1, I think, was one of the numbers we looked at. That's deceptive. You know, that's very difficult to see how many kids you actually have in a classroom. Um, so these are kind of the real numbers in case, uh, you know, a member of the public or someone asked you. But I think these are very desirable. It would be nice if we could somehow find a way to flip them. It seems that our higher numbers are at the lower elementary and our lower numbers at the higher elementary. Um, do you have a breakdown of each homeroom size for center school kindergarten? Do you have averages? Do you have a breakdown for each classroom, one through four? I don't have that right now. I could email okay. that to you. Yes. Um, these just take the total number of kids yep. on October 1, just divide it by the number of rooms. Mm -hmm. But I can email as a follow-up to you tomorrow morning. Thank you. Anybody else? Great, great. thank you. You're welcome. Um, next report for me is just an update for you on our uh, last year's MSBA application. Um, for a new uh, project at the high school. We talked a little bit about this at the tri board meeting last Monday night, but we hadn't received this communication yet from um, the MSBA. We didn't get it until that Wednesday afternoon. But as you recall, we put an application in for the second year uh, for the core program. There were two MSBA programs. One is for the core program, which is really your new school building projects, additions, um, bigger projects. And the second tier programs that they have are called accelerator repair. That would be to, um, say, upgrade a roof or windows or boilers within a building. So in the main uh, core program, we did submit another application for the high school and were notified just based on the competition level that we weren't accepted in uh, for last year. So last week was very busy with the MSBA. I reached out to um, one of my point of contacts there just to try to get a little bit of feedback about our application. I'd gone online quickly to just see of the... Um, Gosh, I want to say 80 or so applications that were filed, I think about 15 uh, were funded. And of that 15, there were only three or four high schools. Of the three or four high schools that did move forward, um, I want to say three out of the four were urban uh, high schools. Uh, they didn't have really suburban high schools in this round. And then there was also a, um, a regional, um, like an Essex Aggie type uh, school that was in there uh, for a uh, for a high school, but it wasn't uh, suburban high schools. So um, I'd like to get some feedback. I'm just kind of letting you know this um, that it's out there, but I'd just like to get some feedback on our application. Um, possibly have a meeting with the MSBA and just again kind of plead our case, talk a little bit about our strategy and how I think one of the things that um, hurts our application is that when you look at Chelmsford as a whole, uh, the strategy that we had uh, kind of gone in at is because all of our schools, our four elementary schools and really um, McCarthy, Parker's on the later end, were all built probably within about a 10 year time period. So they're all very old and aging. Um, it's gonna be very difficult to ever actually put forward five or six projects at the same time. It's highly unlikely we have, as a community could ever sustain that. So when we looked holistically at our, um, our issues, we came at it and said, you know what, if we could build a new state-of-the-art high school uh, like all of our surrounding uh, communities are basically doing, 
we could then have our high school students all have a brand new high school. We could merge our McCarthy and our Parker students at the old high school, which technically is our newest building in town, as opposed to the other one. So at least they're still getting the benefit of a new building. Um, we could bring McCarthy offline, because that's our oldest elementary school. And then we could have Parker School become kind of a float school for elementary. So they could actually help us in the years to come with our elementary population. Again, you've got to be thinking if you're going to do a high school project, you're looking at six to ten years out as far as physically having it open and under construction. And by that point in time, our enrollment projections are continuing to point towards an uptick in enrollment at the elementary level. So we'll be needing to bring on additional capacity. So Parker would be perfect. Um, so we have to kind of be able to somehow, if we're going to continue going down that path, and I certainly think that's the path to go on for the time being. I, I don't think it's worth abandoning and trying to relook at this point and trying to do, say, just a middle school project or just an elementary school project. But we somehow have to um, try to work with the MSBA so that they understand that you know we're looking as a community not as the high school alone is our need, but by doing a high school, it really helps the community solve um, not only the, the middle school needs, but also the elementary school needs. So that we really wouldn't, for you know, the next 15, 20 plus years, have to go back to them for a new school initiative. We might want to entertain some projects under the accelerator repair. If we have roofs on our older buildings that need to be replaced, or boilers and furnaces and things like that, maybe we go back under accelerator repair. But those aren't as difficult to get funded as core projects. Um, so I, I, I'd like to get some feedback. I'll report that feedback back to you. And we should be taking this into consideration as we start to talk about our application for the spring, because I'll need to get working on that. Um, but my opinion at this point uh, would be that we definitely should still pursue that application, um, at least for the time being. And that uh, part of my work, actually, over the course of this next uh, six months or a year, might really need to be um, kind of lobbying and, and filling in some of the, um, uh, the our state argument uh, to make sure that people are on board with this and actually are having all the information that they need when they're trying to make these uh, these decisions for us. When do we have to resubmit by? The core program is in April. Um, it's like <coughs> the first or second week in April. I don't have the exact date. So is it possible for us to meet? Oh, I have with them? the exact date. Oh, okay. it's, uh, it's April twelfth. Okay. Um, is it possible that we can meet with them between now and then just to see, you know, what can we do to improve our, our chances? And, you know. Yeah, they've been very good about that. Um, I actually, we reached out to um, uh, Representative Golden and uh, Nangle uh, when I was in Lowell, and Lowell was trying to actually move forward a project. So the MSBA actually, uh, we had a meeting at the State House, and the MSBA was invited. And it was a great opportunity for us to just be able to kind of tell our story and why we want a particular project. And it still took us a year or two to be able to get the approval. But I think that was uh, telling. Uh, so I think that's something we certainly can do. And we can try between now and probably February vacation to uh, get a meeting on the, on the books. I'll reach out to our representatives and just let them know what we're um, targeting. I'll make sure I'm inclusive of all of them uh, just so that they can all participate. Uh, but I think it would be important to have a meeting with some of the um, executives at MSBA and let them know exactly what our strategy is to just stay on their radar. Any other thoughts on this? Did they come out and do a, a site visit? They didn't this year because they did last year and it was the same application. Okay. So they had done a uh, complete review of our application um, two summers ago, okay. not this past summer, the summer before, and they walked the facility because they hadn't been there in quite some time. So they did not come back out again this summer because, again, they already had the data and it hadn't changed. Um, but no, we, they didn't have any questions about our actual application. I think it just came down to limited resources. And I will say that the schools that were selected over us are in a lot worse shape than Chelmsford High School is. Um, and, and for us, it's just a way to kind of fit, to be able to sell to them that it's part of a bigger solution, that it's not really just Chelmsford High School specific. Yeah, Tingsboro got a middle school. They sorely it. needed it. But I think in talking to Mike, I think this is his holes eighth or ninth time, like uh, eighth or ninth year of actually submitting. Yeah. It's taken yeah. them that long to get their application oh, uh, yeah. uh, into the pipeline. So there's good evidence there, you know, you oh, holes yeah. in the walls and it's eight years. And, they, like and I'm sure if asked, they would say <laughs> there are schools that are in worse shape than we're in. Yeah. You know, it's just always the case. It's just luck of the draw. So more to come, but I just wanted to um, provide that information to you. And my last item on the agenda this evening, item 10, um, there ended up not being any conference or field trip requests, so you don't have to take any action on that this evening. Great. All right. Uh, any liaison reports? 
Um, the Chumps for Friends of Music are meeting on Thursday. The Wellness Committee met last week and are continuing their work on um, exploring the um, idea of after school enrichment programming at the elementary level. And um, CPAC uh, met to begin putting to together their um, school committee presentation. I think they'll be coming Fifth, February. Yeah, February 5th, I think. And um, yes, Lori McCarran. Yeah, Lori McCarran, uh, Bethany Rapoli, and Nancy Duggan uh, met with Tom Golden today to discuss um, where do we go next um, in terms of um, the uh, dyslexia um, bill that was passed. Uh, I know there's some language now up on the DESE website, mm -hmm. um, but I think he wanted to hear from them, okay. you know, what happens next, what was their idea. It didn't pass, did it? It did. Oh, it, it did, did pass. Yeah. Yeah, we have a meeting next month. Did it pass in its original form or was it amended? I don't know that. I don't know if it was amended. I know that when it didn't um, make the first deadline yeah. Yeah. and it needed to be voted on, it had to be unanimous. Okay. Um, and so okay. it was. Okay. Uh, but there is, as I said, language on the Department of Ed website now. I know Amy has been working on that and uh, she's talked to Allie in the group. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll be, and they are on the first meeting in February. Okay. Right. Any other liaison? Um, I attended the uh, Chelmsford Capital um, meetings. And uh, as you know, and were presented at the tri board, I'm sure um, proposed approvals. Um, it was a, a very thorough process. I think that uh, you know, well done, John Souza does an excellent job. Um, went to McCarthy Middle School PTO meeting. It seems very calm there. And then Harrington had a meeting last week, and uh, they st have started a new pickup drop off routine and I think reviews are kind of mixed it seems like it's you know coming into place a little better but you know I don't know if that building can ever have something that's smooth it's Will just it be alleviated at all with the, if we do the new parking hopefully yeah. it's just you know it's, a, it's not a big building it's right next to a busy road you know it's just it's a, it's a very difficult situation so. I do think the um when the parking is done, there's discussion about trying to loop the buses around the front. Mm -hmm. And I do think having some of the off-street parking in parking lots is going to help. They are hampered also by just the amount of traffic and cars coming up yep. from the high school. Yep. It's just, it's not a uh, it's not an ideal no. um, place, and they're trying to make the best of it. But I do think the new parking, um, which did get approved in the capital, that was one of the projects yep. that got approved, hopefully will um, will help them out. Right, and it, he was also, I think, uh, Principal Aslan was also trying to take a look at... Uh, you know, safety as well, not just the parking right. lot safety, right. but the, the, you know, who's coming into the building and, and those kinds of things when he was, uh, you know, redoing this whole process. Yeah, there were some current concerns from parents that I've, you know, talked to about classrooms being dismissed perhaps earlier than they should be. They're, they're not getting out at the bell, they're getting out well before the bell so that, you know, things can line up earlier. Right. Any um, new items? Any action items people have? No, nothing new. No public comments. No, no public. Oh, I did. Yeah, I didn't think I needed that. Um, oh, I did. I did have a new item. Um, with respect to the incident at Harrington, the uh, bullet that was brought into school, we had the same incident happen the year before. Is there anything in the student manual that applies to that? In the student handbook. Yeah, and also dangerous. Yeah, just yeah, dangerous yeah, objects. That, that what high I, what I second. The high school does. Is there no, anything? No, there is in the student handbook, okay. and there's also in the high school handbook. It's uh, like has different steps to it. Okay. So what is? I guess my question is, what are the repercussions for a student bringing a bullet into school because it happened two years in a row? And my thought is, whatever they are, they're not strict enough. So depends on the level of the student, right? So it could be anywhere from um, being not part of certain events like so whether you're like an in-house detention type thing there are suspensions at the elementary and middle school levels are parents brought school. in yep oh yeah are police brought in to oh, talk that's with the first parents person you call okay. is, the, is the police and then you call obviously the parents and they come in and then you make that decision to determine on like what the situation was how it happened then the know. school community is notified that if your student is caught with a bullet in school this is what will happen to you uh, as a family? No, I mean they're told they're, they're sent out that there was an incident at the school yeah. what it was um, you know the principal sends that out through connect ed 
and but you know it's not like a reprimand to the whole community like no, I'm not saying a before. reprimand I think that information should be passed on to the parents so that they are aware that oh my gosh there's a box of bullets over there I better put them away you know so that they're thinking <coughs> these yeah, things well, could happen well we think it would common sense you can't bring a bullet in. I think a lot of it depends on like I said the level of it if it's a, an intent to actually harm other people or if it's just an innocent you know situation uh, they thought it was show and tell. Who knows? Like, there's all it, again. You're talking about a kindergartner all the way up to a twelfth grader. Totally different, you know, animal, beast. So it's, it's the intent might be different, but the outcome could be the same. And that's my concern. I think that people need to understand that dangerous is dangerous. Whether you're 12 years old or 25 years old, if you do something dangerous, it could result in 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 something not, you know. Predictable. And they work with. I mean, they work but, with yeah, the students. I, mean, I think people know that. I mean, yeah. I think that when these issues have happened, I think the parents have taken it very seriously. Mm -hmm. I think the schools have actually addressed it very well when these situations have happened. No one wants these situations to happen. Um, but I think that's why you do have the handbook. But I do think age comes into this, and intent also does come into this because every situation that happens is very individual in the circumstances and how you react and how you respond. Um, but I, I really think that the school handled it incredibly well. Um, I think the police department is a great resource, and they also uh, were involved and handled it very well. Um, I, I haven't heard a criticism, quite honestly, since the day it happened about how we handled it or how the school handled it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was taken very seriously, and um, it was addressed appropriately at the building level with the child and with the family. I guess my criticism would be it happened again. Right. And what happens if it happens next year? You know, there's something that has to be in place that we have to say, this isn't working. But, but I'll be honest with you, it's out of our control. I mean, that, like a, a child bringing something in, it, it hopefully it won't happen again. But I, you know, we're not talking the, the we're not going to get into specifics about kids. Right. But we're not talking the, the same child. Oh, that's just and bad. I can't control what a child might do next week, never mind two years from now. Um, I, I'm concerned with how the school responds, how they get the information that they that they receive, if they act appropriately, working with law enforcement to have it be resolved, and that you know the, the community is involved, not only the Greater Chelmsford community, but the school community mm -hmm. is involved with what happens. And um, again, I think people take it very seriously, and um, I'm concerned at that point with how we actually react and respond, and then follow through with that particular um, family and student to make sure that um, you know they realize it, it, it was inappropriate and it doesn't happen again. I you know I'm I'm I could be wrong, Barbara, but I think what you're saying too is is that we have to make sure that we're letting parents know how we're going to hold them accountable yes. if something like this happens, and it might be worth the principals including in their newsletters on a uh, you know. Uh, more frequent basis that parents should be reviewing the student handbook and you know understand what you know um, is acceptable and that there can be repercussions or consequences if you know certain if the rules aren't followed I mean I think sometimes we look at the handbook at the beginning of the year and then it's just yeah you know but I, I think um, I, I, and like I said Barbara I don't mean to be putting words in your mouth but I think it's uh -huh. about it's I think the school did a great job and I think you know everybody involved did a great job. But you know the question is, how do we get the information to the parents? Like you need to, you know, um, be aware, you know, of uh, the consequences if your child, you know, does something dangerous. And I want to recognize we've been incredibly lucky. You know, there those those kind of incidents. Yeah, they're they're a single bullet that may require a gun to execute, but. There are other things that children can bring to school that may not result in, you know, in such a lucky scenario, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that we have to be, I, along with Alice training, we have to be on our toes on how we address these little things, you know, going forward. No, I, I agree, and, and I do think that you have to do, you have to take a look at this on an individual by individual basis. Sometimes the intent may be, may completely innocent and sometimes it may be malicious um, so you know but I do think it, it is important to continue to remind parents that you know um, there are some things that are just not acceptable in school I mean really things have changed even what you can say in school has changed 
Um, and you know, I think that sometimes, as I said, a good reminder is is always helpful. But again, I think the response that for this particular incident was absolutely the response, and yeah. everybody was informed, and I thought the principal's letter to the parents was was excellent, and you know, and you know. it was absolutely. And I think what Barbara's saying is the next step to everyone is please remember. Okay. Um, yeah. and, and just, I, I do know that the principal addresses the student body oh, as great. well, okay. like over the intercom, because we, we talked about, I mean, obviously the number one priority is as soon as you get that call, is everybody safe? Right. Well, you know, right. please identify what we're doing here. But then they speak with the students directly, uh, and again, it's tonight. sometimes, you know, in elementary school, sometimes it's on the intercom because there's no place to really house them all at the same time. So these are the things we talk about with them and the kind of like what you can do, what you can't do, and you oh, know, the firing order of it all, no pun intended, of it all to make sure that everybody's informed and, and everybody's safe and that the students know, like, yeah, you can't do this. Hey, any other items people have? Um, I just want to remind people that the, um, I don't know, I, I forwarded on, but um, just that we have to um, fill out our acknowledgement of conflict of interest laws again, so we're just going to make sure that we, we take care of that through the town clerk. I don't know if I, forward, I think I forwarded it to you. Is there yeah, you did. Trisha, well, you, then you Trisha sent it yeah. and then. You have to acknowledge it every year. Oh, I'm yeah. I think every two years you have to re take the, the online class. I saw the email. I'll take yeah. care of okay. it. Okay. Yep. All right, um, so at this point, I believe we are going to adjourn to executive session um, yep. and not return. Right, so it will be um, a motion for the school committee to uh, adjourn to executive session with the intent not to return to public session um, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining and litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining and litigation position of the public body and the GSO declares. I move that. I won't <laughs> read it again. Second. <laughs> okay, any discussion? All in favor of moving to executive session, not returning. It doesn't have to be a roll call. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Aye. 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 Aye.